people who've been inside have talked about the quiet, the solemnity, the fact that although they are there with many people, it feels as if they are the only person there. And it has clearly meant a great deal to the tens and thousands of people, uh, many of whom have been in, but many more who are hoping to make their way in over the next three days. Well, we'll have more coverage, of course, of proceedings in central London. Uh, I'd like to take this moment to welcome viewers on BBC Two who are watching our news coverage. We've got many people who are contacting us about the queuing to see the Queen lying in state. And uh, our cor correspondent, Anjana Gadgill, uh, is here with me, I'm happy to say, to answer some of the questions that you've been sending in. Um, and Jan, I may have answered the first question. How long does the lying in state last? Rita, it's 24 hours a day until 6.30 on Monday, which is when the Queen's funeral takes place. Currently, the queue is around four miles long, with the nearest landmark to the back of the queue being Tower Bridge. Now, obviously, anyone coming is being warned. They'll have to stand for many hours as that queue is constantly moving. So Jane is asking if you can provide an estimated waiting time from the end of the queue. Is that possible? It's really hard to estimate as that queue is constantly moving and constantly growing. Uh, there were warnings that it could take up to 30 hours. Uh, most people that we've spoken to have waited between four to eight hours. But it's definitely a consideration if you want to bring your children along with you. Uh, but the government has put a, a live queue tracker for people to follow on YouTube, which is a really good source of information about how the queue is coming Along. And we're seeing that on the screen right now. Where does the queue start? So the queue starts really where you join it, the back of the queue. Uh, the furthest back it can be is Southwark Park. Um, the maximum length the queue can be is 10 miles. So that's seven miles from Westminster to Southwark. And then there's a three mile zigzag queue in Southwark Park. And as you queue, uh, landmarks that you will pass include Tower Bridge, Tate Modern, uh, the South Bank, London Eye, the Albert Embankment, and then you go across Lambeth Bridge into Victoria Tower Gardens before you then enter the Palace of Westminster. So that's where the queue starts. Uh, people are wanting to come from uh, all over the country to come and join it. How do they get there? Well, First of all, check the location of the back of the queue. I mean, the, the website that we can see there is the best place to go for that information. It's currently saying that the, the queue is currently 4.4 miles long and the nearest landmark is now Bermondsey Beach. It was previously Tower Bridge, so that queue is obviously growing longer and longer. Um, check real-time information for how to get there. Uh, Transport for London says the Westminster area is particularly busy. Um, some roads are closed too. Um, consider walking wherever possible and uh, people are being asked to avoid Green Park tube station unless they need step-free access. Wear your trainers as well, presumably. Wear your trainers, yes, and bring some good weather gear as well. Yeah. Um, Sam is asking, why is there not some kind of ticketing system in place? Uh, they seem to think that timed slots would solve so many problems. Yes, and Sam also suggested a virtual queue. There is no virtual queue, but there is a uh, there is a system, a ticketing system in place. So when you arrive, you received a coloured and a numbered wristband. Um, that's as you join. That means you can leave to go to the toilet or go for a drink and then you can return. And we've heard and seen throughout our coverage this morning uh, that people are making friends and getting on well in the queue. People are saving space for people as they come back from the toilet. You'd be very unpopular if you saved a space for a lot of people, though. That right. isn't going to happen. Mm. Um, and you can't put up a tent. You wouldn't need a tent anyway because that queue is constantly moving. We can see it moving, can't we? Carol is saying that presumably there'll be toilet facilities along the queue route as well. That's probably the question that we've been asked the most, actually. <laughs> um, there are more than 500 port that have been set up along the route and lots of cafes and museums, including the Globe and the South Bank Centre, are, are staying open for extended hours so people can use their facilities. And there are water stations along the route, a bit like the London Marathon. Right. <laughs> um, Juliet is asking about, um, is there a separate queue for people uh, with disabilities? Uh, she says that she has reduced mobility and uses two crutches to mobilise. Yes, we've had similar questions from many other viewers. Uh, the queue itself is step free. Of course, it's very, very long as well. There is a separate accessible route which begins at Tate Britain. So that's uh, on the north side of the river near Pimlico and Victoria tube and train stations. Um, there is step free access 
uh, to Westminster Hall and assistance dogs are allowed and there are also visitor assistants in Parliament uh, to guide people but if you are concerned about the route then it would be best to go to the Tate Britain accessible route. Um, St John's Ambulance is there, they're running first aid stations, uh, there are a thousand volunteers, stewards and police officers on the route and the scout groups are out and about helping as well. Yes, I met them, met them yesterday. Um, another question, do I need a ticket or ID? I mean, you've, you've answered that mm. question really. You, you don't? You don't need a ticket, you don't need ID, although there are airport style security checks as you enter the Palace of Westminster itself. Mm. And what should I bring? <laughs> it's England, it could be overnight, um, appropriate clothes as we said, uh, food and drink, although they have to be got rid of before you get to the security checks, the usual things, any medication, a portable mobile phone charger. When you get to the Palace of Westminster you can't take in food, drink or flowers, you can only take in a clear water bottle and a small bag. There is a bag drop facility, but I'm, I've read from the government website that you might have to spend extra time waiting for space there to be, become available. Do you really want to spend that extra time when you've queued for so long already? Um, but look at the Houses of Parliament website for the full list of things you can and can't take in. Right, so travel lightly is probably the main message. And the final all-important question, how do I get home? So train companies have laid on extra train and there will be let trains and there will be limited services throughout the night too. Planned engineering works have been cancelled so people can get to and fro and get some home and get some sleep. And of course, if you can't come to London, there are other ways of paying your respects. Uh, there are books of condolence in libraries and town halls around the country. Churches and cathedrals are open so people can light candles or say prayers. And there is an online book of condolence on the Royal Family website. Angela, many thanks. A mine of information. Thank you so much. Angela Gadgil there. Now, Richard Stone painted a portrait of the Queen back in 1992. It's his most famous work and has been hailed as one of the finest painted of the monarch during Her Majesty's reign. It took seven sittings and three years to complete and was even chosen by the Queen as the Royal Mail airmail stamp. My colleague Joanna Gosling spoke to Richard a little earlier about what it was like to paint the Queen. It was a very special experience. In fact, it was a realization of a dream that I'd held since I was four years old. Um, I embarrassed my family by clutching the railings um, on a birthday treat outside Buckingham Palace, uh, saying quite loudly, I'm going to paint the Queen. Um, my parents were very nonplussed and then quickly bribed me with an ice cream when we went home rather early. <laughs> But I'd held on to that dream and it had been an ambition of mine to paint a portrait of the Queen. And so there I was in my mid-thirties being invited to Buckingham Palace to undertake a very onerous task. Um, and it was hugely thrilling, but needless to say a daunting challenge. Because yes, it was the realisation of a dream, but I, could I pull it off? Um, the Queen was very generous in her time, um, but actually suggested that the sittings should be held over three summers. Mm. Uh, the light could then be relied upon and he hoped it would be constant. But as the three years just melted, um, it became a, a labour of love. Mm. I adored every agonising second of wanting to get it right not letting myself down and perhaps most importantly not letting the queen down mm -hmm. and you use the word agonizing there but as you also said it was a a dream of yours since the age of four there must have been such a sense while you were going through that agony of wanting to get it right of almost pinching yourself in the moment of what you were actually tasked with and the proximity that you had with her majesty during that period well, the Queen was totally professional um, about the, the whole exercise. And remember, the Queen has sat for many portraits. So I don't think she greets the request for another portrait with any sense of glee. Mm -hmm. It has to be considered an occupational hazard. <laughs> but from the very first sitting, the Queen said, Mr Stone, tell me what you want me to do. Mm -hmm. And so I would demonstrate the pose. Um, we'd chosen what she was going to wear and she seemed surprised that I said, may we talk? It was important that I kept her features animated. I wanted to get a sense of what she was like as a person. 
because it's clear that when the Queen, with the aura that she has, wearing the robes of state, and of course, that fabulous George IV diadem looks very much a monarch. Mm. And not wanting to be intimidated by that and mm. really wanting to be honest to myself as a portrait painter, painting a real portrait, mm. what was this lady like? Mm. And so during the course of all those conversations, um, one was able to experience something of the warmth, the mm -hmm. feeling of humanity of the lady, the graciousness, the interest she had in people and the realm, the world. And so one wanted it to sort of recognize a, um, a knowledge and intelligence and wisdom. And I tried so hard to capture something that in many ways is so ethereal. Mm. And the response I've had from many people seeing the portrait that has clearly been seen by so many people now mm. is that I must have captured something because it does resonate with people. It's a picture I'm very proud of. The artist Richard Stone there. Time for a look now at the weather with Helen Willits. It feels a little fresher out and about today and the reason is a change in wind direction. We're now pulling the winds down from the north behind various weather systems bringing showers and that northerly wind is introducing Arctic air right the way across the United Kingdom which means it'll be our first significant chilly snap of the autumn. Quite a windy spell as well. Those winds are quite blustery in the north and the east, pulling in lots of showers for Scotland, one or two in the east. The odd one further west as well, coming down the Cheshire Plains into the northwest Midlands. But you can see those temperatures on a par with yesterday in the north, but notably lower further south. And that's worth bearing in mind if you are coming to London because it will feel quite chilly around the buildings in particular with that blustery wind. There could be a shower the outside chance of a shower tomorrow but it is largely fine and dry but through the evenings and into the nighttime period that's when we'll really notice that chill in fact uh, frost is in the forecast further north over the coming few nights as well and so the wider picture is one of showers continuing through the night and temperatures falling lower but the winds will be a bit stronger strengthening still actually through the course of this night so therefore fewer mist and fog problems but we'll have a touch of grass frost in the glens of Scott and even further south temperatures into single figures. So it looks to Friday we'll see a bit more sunshine but probably a few more showers getting into eastern parts of England and a stronger wind here, really quite blustery. But as the day goes on, it's likely to start to ease further west. So although there will still be the chance of a few showers in the west, probably fewer than today, and the winds start to ease a little here as the high pressure starts to build in. But you can see again tomorrow, mid to high teens, the temperatures for most of us just a little bit below where they should be for this time of year. Now through the weekend, we get this little weather front, a weak weather front as it comes into that high pressure. But we still keep high pressure around, so there's still quite a lot of dry and settled clear weather Friday night into Saturday. So that's where we could have a touch of frost even further south in rural spots, but it'll be very isolated. But it does mean quite a bright start before we get more cloud introduced on our weather front across Scotland. Perhaps some heavier rain here for a time, but then as it meanders southwards during Saturday night and Sunday, it will tend to peter out. But a lot of dry weather once again around during both Saturday and Sunday. And as ever, we'll keep you updated.
This is BBC News. I'm Karen Ginoni. The headlines. Tens of thousands of people are queuing to pay their respects to the Queen as she lies in state in Westminster Hall. The queue outside where we are is now several miles long. People from all over the country and around the world have travelled to join it and say a final farewell. I'm here at Carriage Gates where people just emerging from Westminster Hall having just seen the Queen lying in state. I'm Martine Croxall in the BBC studio. In other news, in Ukraine, amid the devastation of conflict, more claims of atrocities committed by Russian troops. What will happen to energy bills next month? We take a look at what the changes might mean for us. A splash of pink at the funeral of nine-year-old Olivia Pratt Corbell, killed by a gunman in Liverpool last month. The Chancellor considers removing a cap on bankers' bonuses as part of a post-Brexit shake-up of city rules. Hundreds of people have reported seeing a shooting star across the sky over Scotland and Northern Ireland last night. Hello and welcome to Westminster where so many members of the public are now queuing for the Queen's lying in state. In its first full day here in central London, this is a, a little glimpse of the queues that have been going on for hours and hours and hours here just by the Palace of Westminster. The people here go into that white tent that you can see and that means the end of their long wait is in sight. That security in that tent is the final step before they can enter Westminster Hall. The queue stretching back for four miles. This lunchtime, royal officials have confirmed details for Monday's state funeral for Queen Elizabeth II. Now, some detail is emerging. We can tell you now the service will be held at Westminster Abbey before the late Queen is taken to be buried at Windsor Castle. The Queen will be interred with the Duke of Edinburgh, her husband of 73 years in St George's Chapel, in a private service at 7.30pm on Monday. King Charles and his siblings will hold a vigil there at 6.30 on Friday evening, tomorrow evening. Well, Westminster Hall is open to the public day and night until early on Monday morning for people to pay their respects to the late Queen. Her coffin guarded at all times by units from the Sovereign's Bodyguard, the Household Division or Yeoman Warders of the Tower of London. Our correspondent Caroline Hawley reports. It's a week since the country learned of Queen Elizabeth's death, a week of national public mourning and of private grief. And right now thousands upon thousands of people wait patiently to pay their last respects. They've been on their feet all night and there are hours left to go before they'll get to Westminster Hall. The queue, several miles long, snakes along the banks of the River Thames. Wristband, please. Thank you. Wristband. It's been orderly, organised and, by all accounts, a friendly experience. A coming together of people who want to show their gratitude and respect. Look at all these people, you know, it's, um, they're coming for their Queen. There's even tourists here. We've met so many nice people, so it's, it's been lovely. And I would regret if I didn't come. Absolutely regret. Today is the first full day of the Queen lying in state before her funeral on Monday. Last night, Emily and her two sons arrived in London from Birmingham. Can you remember where the end of the queue is, Freddie? It's London Bridge. London Bridge. Let's go and catch the two. Yes! Joining people from all corners of the country and all ages. No bedtime no school today. For them, being here was much too important to miss. We've just come out of seeing Her Majesty. It was absolutely amazing. Awesome. Awesome. Thoroughly worth the six-hour wait that we had. 
In the middle of last night, out of public view, the military was busy rehearsing for its role in this historic moment. Preparations for the Queen's death have been years, decades in the making, meticulous plans now being meticulously practised and finessed. 142 sailors from the Royal Navy will draw the state gun carriage used for Queen Victoria's funeral that will take the Queen's coffin to Westminster Abbey on Monday. Pallbearers even practised their final duty to their former commander-in-chief, carrying an empty black coffin. At 10.44, the Queen's coffin will be taken from Westminster Hall to Westminster Abbey, a solemn journey that will take eight minutes. It was here that she was crowned back in 1953. The funeral service, attended by heads of state from every corner of the globe, starts at 11am. It will be followed by a national two-minute silence. The route of the procession goes past Buckingham Palace and on to Wellington Arch, where her coffin will be transferred into the state hearse. The late monarch will then be driven by road to Windsor Castle for a more intimate service at St George's Chapel, attended by members of the royal family and staff who served her throughout her reign. She will then be laid to rest in the evening in a private service. At Sandringham in Norfolk today, the Prince and Princess of Wales came to greet well-wishers and to look at the many, many floral tributes to the Queen. Inside Westminster Hall, for these members of the public, the long wait to say goodbye was over. Everyone here with their own feelings, memories, emotions. As the country prepares with pomp and pageantry to bid its final farewell to Britain's longest ever reigning monarch. Caroline Hawley, BBC News. Well... Just a reminder that the BBC is offering a continuous 24-hour view of the Queen's lying in state for those who want to pay their respects but can't make it to London or who are physically unable to queue. The service is available on the BBC homepage, the BBC News website and app, the iPlayer on BBC Parliament and the red button. Let's give you a sense of the state of queuing and the amount of time needed to queue at the moment. Uh, the latest that people are telling us is that they've been in the queues for five hours or so and those queues stretch from here just outside the Palace of Westminster right along the River Thames onto the South Bank. Lambeth Bridge isn't far away from here to the west but you go south over Lambeth Bridge then head back east right over around the bend that the river takes as far as Blackfriars. We're hearing uh, Millennium Bridge, people are joining there. And that incredible sight that you can see very, very close to where I'm talking to you from is where they've condensed the crowd into this back and forward uh, taped off section where people go from side to side across the gardens and that makes the queue a lot shorter. And uh, although it does provide a deceptive perspective of where you are in the queue because there is still quite a long way to go. But when you get to the end of that, that's about 20 minutes wait. And the people who are in that right now are saying five, five and a half hours from where they started on the south bank of the River Thames out to the east. But when they see the uh, white tent that you've just seen there, that is the airport style security where bags are scanned, where there are sniffer dogs and people are almost inside Westminster Hall. So it is a long process, but all the way, all through the day, even when we came here early this morning, uh, first thing, first light, people have been up all night standing in that queue, walking through the night. They were not complaining. Let's uh, find out how people are feeling when they emerge from Westminster Hall. Our correspondent Leila Nathu is uh, on the other side of Westminster Palace from here. Leila, how are they feeling? Yeah, these are the gates where people coming out of Westminster Hall will leave Parliament. And it's just a very short distance, actually, between the, the exit of Westminster Hall to the gates that take people out into the streets. They really have very little time to reflect on what they have just seen. People coming out, very emotional, actually. Plenty of tissues here, people discussing with family, with friends, with people they have just met in the queue and visited uh, the Queen's coffin alongside, reflecting on that experience. And there's quite a few people milling around, deciding to, what to do next. The streets are all closed to traffic. So there is quite a, a lot of people gathering here in the streets of Westminster. Now I'm joined uh, by two people who have just left Westminster Hall. One uh, is Len, uh, a former member of the Royal Air Force and his daughter, Kim. Thanks so much for being with us this afternoon. Len, tell us how much it means to you to have been 
here today? It means me a lot because I've lived through five generations of monarchs and I've found, I'm not being... I, I, I like the Queen, I think she was tops a lot of them. She was a beautiful woman, a really lovely woman. And how was it, the experience, filing past her coffin? Well, it was. I, I thought myself, it's what, nice watching it on the TV, but to be there at the presence and taking the salute, it was very emotional for me. And, and you've obviously had to, to bring your wheelchair with you. Was it, was it an all right experience, yes. filing past? Well, I was all right. I can walk a short distance, but I take this for support. It's been a fantastic day. It brings back a lot of memories. After all, I went through 90 days of blitz of London in the east end of London. We survived that, and I've gone through an awful lot. I've got very good memories. In actual fact, my daughter's writing my life story. And, Kim, how, was, how much did it mean to you to bring your father here today? Oh, so much, because he wanted to come and pay his respects, and, and so did I, um, and it's very emotional. Was it what you expected, being inside the Westminster Hall? Oh, the... The history, because I love history, um, the, the atmosphere, it was, yeah, very emotional. So very happy to have been here today. Yes. yes. Thanks so much for being with us here. So you can see everybody has their own story and their own reasons for coming here today, but actually a shared experience that everybody has seen the same thing. And very respectful, I think, people coming here of each other. You know, the, the filing past, nobody has been impatient, nobody's been felt rushed. Everyone's felt that they have been here alongside each other to share that private moment with the Queen's Coffin. Leila, thank you very much. Uh, Leila Nathu and some of the stories are just uh, so moving of people who are making such an effort to come here today. Leila, thank you very much. Well, those queues, we've been talking about them for Westminster, have uh, been stretching all the way along. Lambeth Bridge, Albert Embankment, Metropolitan Police officers as well as officers from all over the country. I just saw Greater Manchester Police, Cheshire Police, as well as many, many stewards and volunteers are managing the queue. I saw someone from the Scouts a minute ago collecting spare food that they were going to donate to food banks. Uh, toilets and water fountains are provided at various points. Our correspondent John Maguire has been talking to some of those people who have been waiting in line. From across the United Kingdom and around the globe, they came and they waited and they queued. All for this, a fleeting but significant moment, a chance to say goodbye not just to a monarch, but to a woman who meant so much to so many. Catherine had flown in from the United States just to be here today. Very emotional. Um and very poignant, very touching um, to see everyone go in and pay their respects and you can just feel the love that everyone has for her. Other journeys weren't as far, but no less important. She had compassion, empathy, forgiveness and love. And I think that has given more to the world than anything. If only other leaders could be that way, wouldn't we live in a wonderful place? It was amazing. I wouldn't have missed it. It was worth waiting 11 hours. It really was. I thought to myself, I'll never see her again. So this was the opportunity that I wanted to go and pay my respects. Maureen and her daughter Emmeline made the decision to come this morning and entered via the accessible queue. She got you through your life, didn't she, yeah. Mum? Yeah, so we're here on behalf of our whole family, aren't we? Yes. Past and present. <laughs> Along the two-mile queue that straddles both sides of the River Thames, there are volunteers on hand to help. Multi-faith teams are here to offer support and solace. This morning, the Archbishop of Canterbury joined them after playing a leading role in recent days. And the idea of coming to see people here today Let's see how people are, where they've come from. Most people are in very good shape. I had a couple of conversations yesterday where the process had renewed their sense of grief over their own losses. Yes, I've heard that a lot. Yes. And and you know that and particularly coming out, chaplains have found that. Leading politicians will have been in Westminster Hall many times, but never before to pay their respects to their monarch. 
By day and by night, they will continue to come over the next few days, compelled by their own reasons, with their own stories, but with one thing in common, the desire to say thank you and to say goodbye. John Maguire, BBC News, Westminster. As we've seen, the Prince and Princess of Wales, William and Catherine, have been in Sandringham in Norfolk today to see the tributes left there. For the Queen, the royal residence was packed with family memories for Her Majesty and it gave her the chance to indulge her love of simple pleasures like walking the dogs or taking tea with the Women's Institute. Jo Black went to find out more. While much of the focus has been in Scotland and London, here in Norfolk on the Sandringham estate, is a growing blanket of flowers, a declaration of people's affection, admiration and appreciation for the late monarch. Where is the Queen? asks three-year-old Matilda. She's up in the clouds, she's told by her mum Charlotte. She has got me, yeah. The Queen was very important, wasn't she? She played a big part in everybody's lives, didn't she? But now, where is the Queen now? Uh, to, uh, in heaven, sky. yeah, in the sky. She's gone. She's gone to rest. It's very emotional and uh, it's, it's really, re you know, really feels as though it's a, a proper place to be on a day like this and a time like this. You know, they're going to learn about at school, so, um, you know, we can tell them they've been bought flowers and, you know, say that they've been and, you know, laid some little flowers for the Queen. The late Queen was, was able, when she was at Sandringham, to, you know, to drive around the, the estate, to be very much the lady with the headscarf on and, 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 the, and the, the, the tartan skirt, and to go and see her foals being born, to walk her dogs around, uh, and, and indeed to, to go to the, the WI, to, into her local shop. The royal family is set off from Sandringham House to inspect the splendid crops being harvested on the King's Estate in Norfolk. This part of Norfolk and its surrounding areas held a particular place in the Queen's affections. Her father, King George VI, loved it here. This footage from 1943 shows him and the then Princess Elizabeth on a family bike ride to inspect the harvest. Like Balmoral, the private residence at Sandringham allowed the monarch time to relax. She and her family spent Christmas here and in January, as president, she would attend the WI meeting. She'd sign the minutes, read annual reports, and one year even went to a very dark village hall on the day of a power cut. These meetings gave the Queen a couple of hours to chat with fellow members and enjoy some light refreshments. She would pour the tea for them and offer them the cakes. And we'd just all chat amongst ourselves and then a little while later the chair would sort of go back a little bit and the handbag would come up and the lipstick would come out and that was the cue to the lady in waiting we were getting ready to move and that really in a nutshell is a meeting it's magical i mean however many times you do it it's still like doing the first one it was very odd and very, it's like a miracle, really. Since the Queen's death, the pupils at Sandringham and West Newton Primary School have been reflecting on their memories of meeting her and other members of the royal family, often at the estate's churches or events like the annual flower show. I'm very pleased that I did get to meet her and I feel proud that I actually got the chance because a lot of people don't get the chance to meet some of the royal family. Well, she gave us all a bit of a wave and she's really kind and gentle um, she asked how the school was getting on um, I think I responded that it was getting on really nice and I was really enjoying it. You've met the future king and that's obviously quite a thing isn't it? Mm. How are you feeling knowing you've already met him? I feel happy and I feel like proud a bit. Since Queen Elizabeth's death was announced around a hundred thousand people have travelled here to pay their respects, to bid farewell and say thank you. For many people here, she was a neighbour, the sovereign who loved this part of Norfolk. Joe Black, BBC News, on the Sandringham Estate. Well, here at Westminster, the people continue to come and uh, they are queuing for what up to about four miles, six kilometres now. That is the latest, with an estimated wait time of five to six hours. That seems to be increasing, but there 
just from uh, not a long way from where we are that is the scene where the crowd is condensed into a small area and although it is moving rapidly there is still a way to go once they get there but uh, the end is in sight once they see this the white tent that is the airport style security very efficiently moving everyone through at quite a pace as you can see from the pictures of, of so many queues the queue walks briskly there is not a lot of standing around in one place nobody that i have met today who has spent hours here waiting has complained whatsoever about the length of time in fact some of the journeys that they've been describing are incredible one man i just met uh, he just landed at heathrow airport from san francisco overnight flight came straight here and queued for six hours has just gone through uh, he will be flying back tomorrow night so uh, then there was someone from New Zealand uh, someone from Cameroon and they'd made friends because standing with people the same people in the queue hour after hour bonds are forming and people are talking to each other and uh, although it is a very solemn atmosphere it is also one where people are warm and friendly to each other but it's very quiet that's what's the striking thing being here the quietness of it all but that is all for now from Westminster. Do stay with us on BBC News, where we will be bringing you all the latest on Her Majesty's lying in state and as well the plans for the state funeral on Monday. For now, back to the studio. Karen, thank you very much more from uh, Karen throughout the afternoon at Westminster. But let's reflect on the past few days with Margaret Macmillan, Emeritus Professor of International History at the University of Oxford. And she joins us now from our studio in Oxford. Professor Macmillan, thank you very much. This must be a fascinating spectacle for you. Of course, a hugely symbolic period of time as we see uh, the crown move from Queen Elizabeth to King Charles. What are your thoughts on what you've witnessed in the last few days? I'm very struck by the sense of community of people coming together. And perhaps there are moments when we recognize that we're part of a wider community. And I think this is one of those moments. And as a number of the people on the street were saying, it's also a time when people reflect on what they value. Um, a lot of people were saying that they were thinking about the people they loved who, who died. And so I think it is one of those moments where we, we stop perhaps, we're all very busy, but we stop and we think about things beyond ourselves, about our community and about those we love. Yes, that loss is universal, isn't it? That sense of, of, of grief. And of course, the royal family are having to continue with their very important ceremonial and constitutional roles whilst juggling with those emotions, which inevitably, of course, they're feeling. It must be very hard for them. And they must be, I, I should think, physically exhausted as well, because the schedule is, is pretty non-stop. But I, I suppose, I mean, what people are mourning in the Queen is, is, is someone who was a symbol as much as she was a human being. I mean, people talk a lot about her as a human being, but they're also talking about her as a symbol of something. And that must be a double burden, I think, for the royal family, because they're mourning both a symbol and they're mourning their mother, their grandmother, um, their, the, the, the someone they was with them all their lives. Tell us what you think we're going to see in terms of the, the difference it's going to uh, be make for us, having a, having a king, a man who has been preparing for this moment his entire life and has had to wait a, a very long time. But of course, he becomes king in a very different era from 1957 when his mother was crowned. Well, I think the royal family and, and the monarchy has changed enormously since the queen was crowned in 1953, and it will keep changing. And Prince Charles, I think, will have his own ideas. He's already had his own ideas about what he wants to do. And it will continue to evolve. I mean, it's a monarchy in the, in the 21st century, no longer in the 20th century. And of course, it's a very different world. He does have, I think, a very heavy burden of expectation because everyone is going to be watching him intently to see what sort of king he's going to be. How does he command that admiration, that respect? It's something that you have to earn over time, I imagine. I think that is part of it. I think the fact that the Queen was there for so long and carried out her duties with such dignity and, and, and really determination, but without making a great sort of fuss of it, I think won her a lot of admiration. And of course, for most of us, she's been Queen of, of Britain all our lives. I mean, she's been there. And that is something that only comes with time. I mean, Prince Charles, now King Charles III, has been a Prince of Wales, but he now will have to become king and, and he will have to spend the time 
that the Queen has, or some of the time that the, that the Queen spent, and that eventually, perhaps, will give him the same sort of um, deep respect that people give, have given to the Queen. Some of the things that have interested um, the Prince of Wales, as he was, over the years, are, are, are very pertinent now. To what extent does that give you an idea of the, the, the issues he's going to focus on, where he can, whilst remaining apolitical? Well, he was one of the early people talking about climate change, and he's always been a very keen environmentalist. He's always been very concerned about climate change. He will have more constraints now, even more constraints than he had as Prince of Wales. He'll have more constraints as king. But I imagine, who can predict, but I imagine that he will continue in his own way to highlight his concerns and the concerns that the world has about climate change. He remains head of state, of course, for a number of uh, countries. I wonder how many of those are going to want that to continue? I think it depends very much on the country. Um, in Australia, of course, there is a fairly strong Republican movement, and, and, but the current Prime Minister has said this is simply not an issue they're going to tackle at the moment. But they've got other things that they want to worry about, including their relationship with the Aborigines. In Canada, there really isn't much of a Republican movement. I think, on the whole, Canadians prefer to have a monarchy because it distinguishes us from the United States. But in some of the West Indian islands, there already has been a move towards becoming a republic. I don't think that will necessarily make a difference to the relationship of those countries that are republics with the Commonwealth or with Britain. I and mean, that relationship is always evolving. And the Commonwealth has included republics since the Second World War, since India became independent. In terms of modernizing the, the royal family, that can't stand still either. How likely is it, do you think, that we're going to see a, a smaller group of, of royals carrying out those duties? It's pretty well known, I think, um, pretty much an open secret, that Prince Charles, like his father, the King Charles III, like his father before him, um, Prince Philip, thought that the monarchy should be slimmed down, that it should become um, only something with, with working royals, and that, that those who, who are by birth part of the royal family needn't necessarily be part of it. And I would imagine that this is something that he's going to take very seriously indeed. And it seems to me that that would be something that is appropriate. Again, we're in the 21st century, and, and I think monarchies have to evolve. And, and the Dutch monarchy, the Danish monarchy, the Swedish monarchy uh, have all evolved, I think, to become less formal, um, less rigid, um, and again, smaller in, in the numbers of those who actually go out and do the royal work. Margaret McMillan, Emeritus Professor of International History at the University of Oxford. Great to have your insight this afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Treasury is considering removing a cap on bankers' bonuses as part of a post-Brexit shake-up of city rules. The BBC has been told that no final decisions have been made, but the Chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng, is considering as a way of making London a more attractive place for global banks to do business. Well, our business editor, Simon Jack, is here. What is this cap as it stands at the moment? Simon? Okay, this was introduced in 2014 and it limits bankers' bonuses to two times their base pay. Introduced after the financial crisis as a way of trying to limit the amount of excessive risk taking, which many people thought spawned the crisis. Now, what it did to banks is to keep bankers in the manner to which they were accustomed. They actually raised their basic pay so that they would basically get to where they were before. And that was bad for banks, they thought, because it meant that my fixed costs go up. I'm less able to dial up or dial down pay based on the profits or losses of the company. So the banks think it's a good idea to keep them, to, to, to be able to marry the profitability of the firm and the actual money I pay out. So the removal of the cap then might appeal to them. What's being mooted? What's being mooted is the economic case, from the, as far as the Chancellor is concerned, is that if you do this, something the banks actually quite like, then they would put more business into the UK, and in particular London. More business means more economic activity, means more growth, which they're very focused on, and ultimately more tax. Although I have to say the economic case for that is not universally accepted. A lot of people think that actually the amount of tax the financial services sector has paid has been pretty stable, both before the cap and after the cap, so not a slam dunk in terms of the actual economic impact, but obviously politically, it's a, a real hot potato. What is the connection to it being in a post-Brexit era that this is happening? Well, so it was an EU-wide policy that was introduced, and when we left the EU, 
all these regulations were basically moved en masse onto the UK statute books. So it is there, it is there to be got rid of if people like. And so a lot of people say, look, this could be seen as a Brexit win. It's in the pro-growth strategy of the Chancellor. You could chalk it up and say, here's something we could do, which we couldn't do before. But politically, maybe at this particular moment, lifting the lid on bankers' pay when people are struggling with the cost of living crisis, and do those red wall seats that um, were Brexit dividends were promised to, was this top of their list, lifting bankers' pay? Probably not. So I think it's going to be very controversial. There's differing views on how determined the government are to do this. Some people say they're flying a kite to see how it goes down. Politically, I don't think it's going to go down particularly well. The timing's pretty bad. Um, but the government has really put, nailed its colours to the mast, saying anything that promotes more activity, more growth, we're in favour of, um, as I say, very controversial at a time when many people are facing crushing uh, cost of living. But more risk as well, potentially. Yes, but what they, what they say is that after the financial crisis, a number of other regulations came in to try and limit risk. For example, senior people at these banks can now be held, held personally and potentially criminally responsible for any misconduct, whilst they, any excessive risk taking and misconduct. Um, and and that, that would uh, be a disincentive to that. Um, and so other regulations have um, arrived to take its place. But like I say, it is of the bankers I speak to, it is not top of their list. They think actually quite like having higher basic pay. Makes my life, my, my income more stable, bit of a quiet life, don't have to work quite so hard to get that bonus at the end of the year. But the banks do quite like it because, as I say, it allows them to uh, calibrate pay along with success or failure. Um, but yeah, it's going to be a hot potato for sure. Yep. And the unions hate it. And a lot of, you know, a lot of other people say it's an insult to other workers. Simon, for the moment, thank you very much. Simon Jack, our business editor. A Ukrainian government advisor says around a thousand dead bodies have been found in the recently liberated city of Izium, which had been under Russian occupation for months. The number of dead in Izium hasn't been officially announced or independently verified. The city has been heavily damaged by shelling. From Kiev, Hugo Bachega sent this report. This is what the Russians left behind in Izium, a key city now back in Ukrainian hands. Almost nothing remains untouched by the war. These are the visible scars. What lies beneath, it's still not clear. Bodies are being found and allegations of torture are emerging. The horrors of life under occupation. We were staying in the basements without food and water. Russia was providing humanitarian help, and initially I refused to take it. To be honest, I didn't want to take anything from Russia, but we had nothing to eat. We had to survive. Ukraine is pressing ahead. It says all invaded territory will be taken back. It knows it won't be easy but it feels it's got the momentum. Here, a show of defiance, a visit by President Zelensky with the front line just miles away. His message was as clear as ever. You see that Russia is destroying, and you see the mass of the stretch again. But the main thing that we are coming back and we are on the way to the end. But Russia is fighting back. Perhaps it's no coincidence that this time they attacked the president's hometown. A dam was hit and residents had to evacuate. Ukraine's advancing Kharkiv has been stunning. Officials say an area larger than the Count of Devon was recaptured in just a few days. But what happens next? In the south, the situation is said to be more difficult. There, the top prize is the city of Kherson. As many as 20,000 Russian troops are believed to be holding up with limited supplies. After pushing the Russians out of the northeast, the Ukrainians hope to do the same elsewhere. Much will depend on what this man decides to do. President Putin today arrived in Uzbekistan for talks with regional leaders. At the top of the agenda, a meeting with President Xi of China. For the Kremlin, the visit is designed to show that Russia isn't isolated and the Western sanctions haven't worked. But with his army and the economy in trouble, the world is waiting to see his next move. Hugo Mashega, BBC News, Kiev. We've got some uh, breaking news uh, to bring you. Roger Federer is retiring from uh, tennis, of course.
that's the sport he plays. It would be, wouldn't it? He's 41, which had a, he's had a remarkable career. 20 Grand Slam final, uh, final victories in the singles. Laura, this has got to be one of your top stories today. Yes, how, how did you know? <laughs> yes, uh, when you think of tennis, you do think of Roger Federer. So this is quite surprising news for many. Some breaking news indeed in the last few moments. Roger Federer has announced he is to retire from tennis. The 20-time Grand Slam winner has released a letter on his social media saying it was a bittersweet decision, but there is so much to celebrate. He thanked his family and fans, but he says the past three years have presented him with challenges due to injuries and surgeries, and he must recognise when it is time to end his competitive career. Next week's Labour Cup in London will be his final ATP event, and of course, There'll be more on this breaking news on the BBC Sport website. Now, with the World Cup just over two months away, England manager Gareth Southgate has named his squad for the final round of games in the Nations League. And amongst the 28-man squad is Brentford's Ivan Toney, who gets his first call-up to the senior side. The striker has scored five goals in six league matches so far this season. Goalkeeper Dean Henderson is also recalled for the upcoming matches against Italy and Germany. Manchester United duo Jadon Sancho and Marcus Rashford miss out. Meanwhile, Northern Ireland manager Ian Barraclough has included a new face in his squad. Kofi Balmer gets his first call-up for the matches against Kosovo and Greece later this month. Northern Ireland have gone 14 matches without a win in the competition and have currently just two points from four games. England's one-day captain Joss Butler says he and his teammates want to honour the Queen during their historic tour of Pakistan. The squad arrived in the country earlier today ahead of seven T20 internationals, the first of which gets underway on Tuesday. It's the first time England have toured Pakistan in 17 years and Butler hopes they can make the Queen proud. Her Majesty the Queen passing, we were, um, obviously was deeply saddened by that. I think we've could have seen the reaction, especially at, at home in England, to her passing. And, and um, you know, I think yeah, cricket did a fantastic job at the Oval um, you know, to, to honour her and, and the way that game was, was played. And um, you know, some special scenes watching on, on the TV. So uh, we hope to honour her in, in our own way as a, a T20 team and, and play in a fashion um, you know, to do that. Yorkshire Cricket Club have announced that they've reached a settlement agreement with former coach Andrew Gale and ex-bowling coach Richard Pyra following their sackings last year. The pair were among 16 members of staff sacked in December in the fallout from the Azim Rafiq racism scandal. The compensation package comes after Gale and Pyra won a claim for unfair dismissal in June. Scotland have named their 32-player squad as they prepare for their first Women's Rugby World Cup since 2010. Head coach Brian Eason has included 19-year-old Emma Orr, who only made her debut in the Six Nations earlier this year. Rachel Malcolm will captain Scotland, who are in Pool A, alongside New Zealand, Australia and Wales. The tournament gets underway in early October. In domestic rugby, Worcester Warriors have released a statement confirming they have not been placed into administration, despite a letter from the Department of Digital, Culture, Media and Sports suggesting it had been. The Warriors say they are waiting for an agreement with an undisclosed buyer to be signed as they look to clear debts of over £25 million. They add the letter was sent out in error by the DCMS, who have apologised for their mistake. The chief executive of golf's Rebel Live series has accused the rival PGA Tour of trying to destroy the new competition, with Greg Norman saying he made several attempts to negotiate with the PGA Tour. The Saudi-backed Live series has caused controversy after creating three-day tournaments that have lucrative winnings available and run at the same time as both PGA and DP World Tour events. The series has attracted a number of big-named golfers, all of whom have since been suspended by the PGA Tour. That's all your sport for now. I will be back in an hour with another update, but just a reminder there that we have had some breaking news that Roger Federer has retired or will be retiring from tennis after the Labour Cup. Laura, thank you very much. Many people have been contacting us about the queuing that uh, you need to do to see the Queen lying in state. Well, our correspondent, Anjana Gadgil, uh, joins us now. 
to answer some of those uh, questions. I mean, they're fairly reasonable ones if you're thinking about spending all that time in that queue. How long is lying in state going to last is yeah. the first question. We've had lots of questions and that is the most basic of all I think. It's 24 hours a day until 6.30 on Monday morning which is when the funeral takes place. Currently the queue is over four miles long with the nearest landmark to the end of the queue being Tower Bridge and anyone coming is being warned that they'll need to stand for many hours as that queue is, is constantly moving of course. Yes, it constantly moving constantly getting a bit longer a bit shorter Jane asks could we provide an estimated waiting time from the end of the queue to the beginning of it not just how long it is it's really hard to estimate because that queue is constantly moving constantly growing and some points getting slightly shorter as well so it's, it's evolving all the time um, there were warnings initially that it could take up to 30 hours People we've spoken to on the ground today say it's taken them between four to eight hours, but it's definitely something to consider if you're going to bring your children along with you. The government have put a live queue tracker on YouTube for people to follow, which tells you how long the queue is in terms of miles and where the nearest landmark is, so if you want to head to the back of the queue. Yes, so where is it starting at the moment? The well, so the furthest back it can be is in Southwark Park in Bermondsey, and the maximum length of the queue is 10 miles. It, they'll pause it at 10 miles. Uh, so that includes seven miles from Westminster to Southwark, and then there's a three-mile zigzag in Southwark Park. As you come back from along the route, uh, the landmarks will include Tower Bridge, Tate Modern, uh, the London Eye, and then across Lambeth Bridge into Victoria Tower Gardens and then into Westminster itself. I'm sure there'll be lots of people willing to give directions. How do people get there then? Because I mean, th there are supposedly some restrictions in place of where you can and can't walk. So go onto the, the government's YouTube live tracker which shows you where the back of the queue is right now and then the best thing to do is to check the real-time travel information. Uh, London will be, already is, and will be very, very busy and Westminster exceptionally so. Uh, people are being asked to avoid Green Park tube station unless, the, unless they need step-free access. Okay. Now Sam asks, why isn't there some kind of ticketing system in place? It seems that timed slots like a virtual queue could solve some of the problems. Yes, there is no virtual queuing system in place, but there is a system in place. Um, people receive a coloured and a numbered wristband when they arrive. Um, so that means once they're queuing, they can leave for a drink or to go to the toilet, and then they can return to the queue. And we've heard and seen all morning and throughout the night that people are making friends in the queue. People are reserving their spaces, making sure they don't miss out. But I think because of the relationships people are building, you would be very unpopular if you got to the queue early and saved spaces for your friends. That would be, there'll be lots of tutting if that I, took place. I'm sure there would be a tutting and raising of eyebrows. Um, Carol asks, presumably, there are toilet facilities along the route. That's the question we've been asked the most about the toilets. Um, there are 500 port along the route that have been added, um, but lots of cafes and museums, including the South Bank Centre and uh, Shakespeare's Globe Theatre are opening for extended hours so people can use the facilities there. Here's a Shakespearean name, Juliet. Juliet asks, have um, reduced mobility, she has reduced mobility and she has to use two crutches to get around. Will there be a separate queue for people with disabilities? And if so, what are the details? And we've had this, a similar question from many others as well. Uh, the queue itself is step free. Of course, it's very long. Uh, there is a separate accessible route which starts at Tate Britain. So that's on the north side of the River Thames um, by Victoria and Pimlico tube stations. So if you need assistance with your uh, queuing, then it's best to go to the to take Britain and start it there instead. Um, there is then step-free access into Westminster Hall. There are also um, assistance dogs are allowed and there are lots of visitor assistance in Parliament that can help people in. OK, thank you. Um, do you need a ticket or ID? You don't need a ticket, you don't need ID. Uh, there are airport-style security checks when you get to the Palace of Westminster itself. What should people bring? OK. The weather's pretty all right it's okay at the dumb. moment but yeah. it is england it can change at any time so the necessaries i guess so raincoat sunscreen warm clothes i mean it, you know who, who knows what the weather has in store um food and drink for the queue although they will need to be got rid of as you enter the palace of westminster and security checks any medication um a portable phone charger uh, but once you actually get there, you can't take in any food or any drink or any flowers. You can only take in a, a clear plastic bottle and a small bag. And although there is a bag drop, so you can leave bags should you need to, they're expecting queues there as well, which might be the last thing you need after a very long queue to then have to go and queue again. Yeah. 
Um, and how do people get home again? Actually, I should just say, on, in addition to that question, if you want to know the full list of rules about what you can and can't take in, the House, House of Parliament website is the best place to Excellent. go. Excellent. Thank you. Good, good uh, pointer. How do people get home again? Yes, so the, the train companies are laying on extra trains and there are limited services throughout the night as well. Um, planned engineering works have also been cancelled so people should be able to get home, get a good night's sleep. Um, and of course, not everyone can come to London. Um, so books of condolence are open at lots of um, town halls and libraries across the country. Churches and cathedrals have, open open their, have also opened their doors for people to, to light a candle or say a prayer. Um, and there's an online book of condolence, and that's on the Royal Family website. And of course, BBC broadcasting live coverage of, of the scene, if people can't make it any other way. Absolutely. All day, every day. And all night, yes. Angela, thank you very uh, much. I imagine there'll be some very tired people on those trains home and don't miss your stop. Since the death of the Queen, questions have arisen about the fate of her corgis, the pets that she has treasured since childhood. Now it's been revealed that her beloved dogs will be looked after by her son, Prince Andrew, and his ex-wife, the Duchess of York. What now then for the corgi community? Joining us now, the Corgi Snowden Jam and Honey, and the man who trained the uh, Queen's uh, Corgis, Roger Mugford, as well as Sam Cadder, who is an owner of the breed. Thank you both uh, for joining us here on uh, the BBC News Channel this afternoon. Why the Corgi? Why, is, why has the Corgi been such a favourite of the Queen all these years? Well, the, the, the first dog that she had when she was a wee girl, of age seven, was a Corgi puppy. And the first breed of dog, type of dog that someone is given, be it a Labrador, a Pitbull or, or a Border Collie, it tends to be the, your belief that this is the only type of dog to have. And I think that was true for Her Majesty. She loved this first corgi. She loves, loved all the 30 corgis that followed in their footsteps. Um, and she was a, a very devoted owner to all dogs, but particularly, of course, to her many corgis. And, and almost they are her trademark breed of dog. They absolutely are. Um, Sam, tell us, what's so good about a corgi? What sort of pet does it make? I think that they're terribly charming. I think that they are uh, very intelligent, easy to train. They can wrap you around their little finger. And I think having three, I'm perhaps maybe quietly mummified, but I think that um, a dog that personifies the ethos of the queen, um, someone that's very regal, someone that um, has great stature, and someone with a bit of a sense of humor too. I don't think you can go wrong with a corgi. Well, they, are, they, they look they... immensely well behaved. You've said, Sam, that they are, well tra they are easy to train. How, do, how did you go about training the Queen's Corgis, uh, Roger? What, what specifically did they need to be able to do or not do? Firstly, Michelle, Her Majesty was a very talented trainer. Her dogs, when she was present, were very much under control. It's when she was absent and other members of the household or possibly family had to care for them that they were less able and that's when fights tended or did occur. Uh, and just the numbers of dogs. She had nine corgis and a couple of doggies. So that's just five, six, seven dogs too many for anyone to handle. So Her Majesty... Uh, had a soft spot for puppies, you know, sh shall I keep one, shall I keep three? And, and that was her mistake. And uh, other members of the family commented, as did I, that maybe, Mum, you have too many dogs. Um, and, of course, the, the numbers did decrease over the following years. And by 2016, sadly, the last one did, did die of natural causes. But Prince Andrew donated two puppies to her in, I think, 2018. And so in her latter years, she had the pleasure of the company of Corgis. And believe me, it was a fantastic pleasure for her. This, this was the great relaxation, the great therapy from dealing with the stressful affairs of state. I'm surprised you had the nerve to tell Her Majesty that she had too many dogs, Roger. <laughs> I really am. She um, did. <laughs> she put me down very firmly. She said, that's Philip said I've got far too many dogs and you come here and I'm paying you good money to tell me what I already know. <laughs> so, um, well, firmly I'm a, put I'm me queen, in my place. I'm with Queen Elizabeth. I have one dog and it's not enough. Um, I can't imagine what it would, how, the heaven it would be to have nine. Uh, Sam, how well are these dogs going to adapt to be looking after, being looked after by Prince Andrew 
and uh, the Duchess of York, because of course, of course they're bound to have been attached to the Queen. Yes, well, um, Roger had mentioned previously that the, Queen, um, the Duke of York does have two dogs already. Um, I think that they'll adapt well. They are adaptable, I think, in a home filled with love, with discipline, that they will get on well. I think that they will obviously notice the change in uh, the late Her Majesty not being present for them. I think that um, it'll be a period of adjustment, but I think that they will be fine. Oh, your three are beautiful. Aren't they well behaved? They just know that they're on TV. You uh, Roger, them on a good day. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, we're we're grateful to them. Uh, Roger, what about the breed in future then? If this was very much the breed that was identified with the Queen, of course, what's uh, King Charles's preference going to be? Well, I believe he's attached to Jack Russell's, and so am I. Uh, I'm attached, as I'm sure the Prince is, of the King rather is attached to all dogs um, and every dog has its peculiar merits um, so, but I think I foresee a big increase in the popularity of corgi keeping at least in the UK but you know the good news is that in North America in Australia corgis have remained popular uh, though their numbers greatly decli declined uh, 20 and 10 years ago in the UK but and I think now we'll see a resurgence in popularity a moment ago I, well think you said, I think you said a corgi and a doggy is that right well, a, a, a corgi, it's now very fashionable to have these first cross hybrids of cockapoos and the like. Um, well, the Queen set a trend of having a first generation hybrid cross between a dachshund and a corgi. So dorgies entered the, the lexicon, entered the vocabulary. And, um, and of course, that was a dog belonging to Princess Margaret and I think one puppy to um, uh, the Queen Mother. So. Um, Look, the purebred corgi is difficult to beat. Uh, it, it, as Sam says, has so many merits. It's a, a, a big-minded, hearted, working dog in a small body. And yes, they are usually good-natured, but they're highly trainable. And that's the great news about them. They have all the training qualities of a Border Collie. Oh, well, they are. They're, they'd beat you at chess, wouldn't they, a Border Collie? Far too, far too clever to have in the house. Uh, Roger and Sam, uh, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon and bringing um, your trio of uh, corgis to meet us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Well, as the nation and people across the world mourn the loss of Queen Elizabeth II, the BBC has set up a web page where viewers and listeners can share their memories and pay tribute. You can send your tributes in words, still pictures or video by email to yourqueen at bbc.co.uk. You can use WhatsApp on plus four four seven seven five six one six five eight zero three. All of the details, if you didn't have a pen to hand, there you are, they're at the bottom of the page. Got there eventually. If I slow down a bit, you might have a chance to take a screen grab or something. Um, it's also all on our website and there's a contact form for you to use as well. In the next few days, we should be hearing from our energy suppliers about what's happening to our bills in two weeks' time. It's been a week since the government announced the energy price guarantee, which brings down the amount that bills were due to increase by in October. But the vast majority of households will still, still see an increase in the rate that they pay as we move into the autumn. Our consumer affairs correspondent, Coletta Smith, has been finding out what it'll mean for our bills. Keeping the lights on is getting more expensive for most of us next month. But many of the parents at this school are facing unimaginable choices. Everybody's feeling the pinch, everybody's starting to make decisions that they never thought they'd have to make and they're difficult decisions but they don't come anywhere close to the decisions that the most needy have to make and, and nobody living today and, and I think for generations nobody's made this decision, difficult ones about what we sacrifice and food, energy and clothing and books for children should definitely not be on the list. The government stepped in last week and reduced the amount the price cap will go up by. This government is moving immediately to introduce a new energy price guarantee that will give people certainty on energy bills. So direct debit customers on a basic default tariff will now be charged 34 pence per kilowatt hour for electricity and 10.3 pence for gas. 
but everyone's bill will look different. For a typical household, it's around £2,500 a year, which is £1,000 more than this time last year. But that's just to give you an idea of what the new prices will look like. If you use more gas and electricity than that, you'll be paying more than that. The government are also knocking £400 off everyone's bill for the next six months. But October's price is still a rise, and millions of people have already been struggling. When you are on an income support, it's very hard to cope with it. See how it goes. Got an email saying it's going up, but we don't know how much yet. Oh, mate, like, it's unaffordable now. Like, it is, what can you do, though? It's always going to be like that. This neighbourhood is one of many likely to see a big increase in the number of people unable to afford their bills. What's happening now is the deepening of fuel poverty experience. So some people will have been experiencing that for the last 10 years. Maybe it's just got even harder than it did. These are the solid wall houses. They need a bit more money investing than do houses with cavity wall insulation. But it, it, it's an area where lots of people don't have very much money and, and then where people really need that kind of uh, extra support in order to be able to, to live decent lives, to be, to be well enough to go to school and to go to work. Without extra help targeted at the most vulnerable, it's feared millions more families won't be able to afford the bills as the price goes up and the temperature goes down. Coletta Smith, BBC News in Leeds. A funeral mass has been taking place today for nine-year-old Olivia Pratt Corbell, who died after being shot at her home in Liverpool nearly a month ago. Pink ties, jackets, scarves and bows were worn by those attending the service after her family asked people to wear a splash of pink. Correspondent Judith Moritz, who's in Liverpool, has been giving us the latest. Yes, and crowds of people lined the streets here and came out to see Olivia's coffin as it was brought by a horse-drawn hearse to the church. And following as part of the, the funeral procession was her mum, Cheryl Corbell. Now, Cheryl Corbell was herself injured in the gun attack which killed Olivia and still nursing the wrist injury uh, from that night. She gave the eulogy. She said that her daughter was the family mimic, that she had a great imagination and would have made a great lawyer, she said, as she had an answer for everything. And the Archbishop of Liverpool, uh, Reverend Malcolm McMahon, also spoke and uh, he, he linked Olivia's death to that of the Queen. He said that King Charles III has described his mother's life as a life well lived and the same can be said of Olivia. Uh, now, one of the more poignant aspects of this morning, I think, is that you could hear the shouts of Olivia's school friends playing in the playground just next door, her primary school, just next to the church. And the, the school's head teacher, Rebecca Wilkinson, spoke earlier about how the school has been remembering Olivia today. So the wishes of the family in church were that everyone wore a splash of pink. So today in school, the children are all wearing a splash of pink. We've got pink hearts in the windows, facing the main road. We've got ribbons on the fence, pink ribbons on the fence. Well, uh, earlier this week, Merseyside police searched a golf course near to here for the guns used in the attack. So far, nine men have been arrested in connection with uh, Olivia's murder. No charges, though, and yesterday, a £50,000 reward was offered for information, which may lead to the conviction of those responsible. Judith Moritz in Liverpool. Hundreds of people have reported seeing a shooting star across the sky over Scotland and Northern Ireland. The UK Meteor Network said it began getting reports of the fireball last night. Scientists are using video footage filmed by the public to work out whether the object travelling across the night sky was a meteor or space junk and where it came from. It's not yet known if it landed or burnt up in the atmosphere. Time for a look at the weather forecast and it's Helen. I'm reliable. There'll be plenty more dry and bright weather around for the rest of the day. There is quite a bit of cloud in the skies and it has been thick enough for the odd shower across northwest England, parts of Wales, across Northern Ireland. But the heaviest, most frequent showers are across northern and eastern parts of Scotland, just the odd one in the east. And it's breezy out there, quite a blustery breeze in the north and the east. And the change in wind direction to a northerly has made it feel much fresher out and about. And that will continue through the night. The breeze continuing to blow showers into northern and eastern areas and around the Irish Sea coasts as well. But temperatures will fall lower 
even further south tonight into single figures with ground frost in the glens of Scotland. It's likely we'll see a bit more sunshine around though tomorrow, but with that brisk wind picking up further, it will carry the showers, more showers potentially into eastern parts of England as well as the northeast of Scotland. So another fresh feeling day, perhaps fewer showers in the west. This is BBC News, I'm Karen Ginoni. The headlines. Tens of thousands of people are queuing to pay their respects to the Queen as she lies in state in Westminster Hall. The queue outside is now several miles long. People from all around the country, all over the world, have travelled to join it and say a final farewell. I'm at carriage gates outside the Palace of Westminster as thousands emerge from paying their respects to the Queen. I'm Martine Croxall in the BBC studio. In other news, in Ukraine, amid the devastation of conflict, more claims of atrocities committed by Russian troops. What will happen to energy bills next month? We take a look at the, what the changes might mean for us. A splash of pink at the funeral of nine-year-old Olivia Pratt Corbell, killed by a gunman in Liverpool last month. The Chancellor considers removing a cap on bankers' bonuses as part of a post-Brexit shake-up of City of London rules. Hundreds of people have reported seeing a shooting star across the sky over Scotland and Northern Ireland. The 20-time Grand Slam singles champion Roger Federer will retire from top-level tennis later this month. Hello, welcome to Westminster, where members of the public are queuing for the Queen's lying in state. It is its first full day. Now the queue, you can see it here where it condenses near the Palace of Westminster, stretches back for 2.8 miles, according to the latest update. That's around five kilometres. And this lunchtime, royal officials confirmed some of the details for Monday's state funeral for Queen Elizabeth II. The service will be held at Westminster Abbey in London before the late Queen is taken to be buried at Windsor Castle. The Queen will be interred with the Duke of Edinburgh in St George's Chapel in a private service at 7.30 in the evening on Monday. King Charles and his siblings will hold a vigil there at 7.30 tomorrow evening, Friday. Now it's... Uh, really a scene where more and more people continue to arrive here. Westminster Hall is open to the public day and night, right through until the early hours of Monday morning, 6.30 a.m., for people to pay their respects to the late Queen, and they come in their tens of thousands, queuing all along the bank of the south bank of the River Thames. Her coffin is guarded at all hours by units from the Sovereign's bodyguard, the Household Division, or yeoman warders of the Tower of London. And here, the white tent you can see in front of the Palace of Westminster is the security check. It's an airport-style security system that the people are going through very efficiently. It's running very smoothly, and people are moving at a rapid pace through there before they proceed into the hall. Correspondent Caroline Hawley has more. It's a week since the country learned of Queen Elizabeth's death, a week of national public mourning and of private grief. And right now, thousands upon thousands of people wait patiently to pay their last respects. They've been on their feet all night and there are hours left to go before they'll get to Westminster Hall. The queue, several miles long, snakes along the banks of the River Thames. 
It's been orderly, organised and, by all accounts, a friendly experience. A coming together of people who want to show their gratitude and respect. Look at all these people, you know, it's, um, they're coming for their queen. It's, there's even tourists here, we've met so many nice people, so it's, it's been lovely. And I would regret if I didn't come, absolutely regret. Today is the first full day of the Queen lying in state before her funeral on Monday. Last night, Emily and her two sons arrived in London from Birmingham. Can you remember where the end of the queue is, Freddie? It's London Bridge, Mummy. London Bridge. Let's go and catch the queue. Yes! Joining people from all corners of the country and all ages. No bedtime, no school today. For them, being here was much too important to miss. We've just come out of seeing Her Majesty. It was absolutely amazing. Awesome. Awesome. Thoroughly worth the six-hour wait that we had. In the middle of last night, out of public view, the military was busy rehearsing for its role in this historic moment. Preparations for the Queen's death have been years, decades in the making, meticulous plans now being meticulously practised and finessed. 142 sailors from the Royal Navy will draw the state gun carriage used for Queen Victoria's funeral that will take the Queen's coffin to Westminster Abbey on Monday. Pallbearers even practised their final duty to their former commander-in-chief, carrying an empty black coffin. At 10.44, the Queen's coffin will be taken from Westminster Hall to Westminster Abbey, a solemn journey that will take eight minutes. It was here that she was crowned back in 1953. The funeral service, attended by heads of state from every corner of the globe, starts at 11am. It will be followed by a national two-minute silence. The route of the procession goes past Buckingham Palace and on to Wellington Arch, where her coffin will be transferred into the state hearse. The late monarch will then be driven by road to Windsor Castle for a more intimate service at St George's Chapel, attended by members of the royal family and staff who served her throughout her reign. She will then be laid to rest in the evening in a private service. At Sandringham in Norfolk today, the Prince and Princess of Wales came to greet well-wishers and to look at the many, many floral tributes to the Queen. Inside Westminster Hall, for these members of the public, the long wait to say goodbye was over. Everyone here with their own feelings, memories, emotions. As the country prepares with pomp and pageantry, to bid its final farewell to Britain's longest ever reigning monarch. Caroline Hawley, BBC News. Well, a reminder that the BBC is offering a continuous 24-hour view of the Queen's lying in state for those who want to pay their respects but can't make it, perhaps, to London or who are physically unable to queue. The service is available on the BBC homepage, the BBC News website and app, the iPlayer on BBC Parliament and the red button. The queues for Westminster Hall have been quite something. They've been stretching all along Lambeth Bridge, Albert Embankment. There are police officers, not just from the Met, the Metropolitan Police, but from all over the country. I've seen Greater Manchester Police, Cheshire Police arriving by the busload all through the last few hours. There are so many volunteers here as well serving the needs of people in the queue and stewards. There are toilets and water fountains provided at various points. So everybody in the queues, although they weren't in the mood to complain anyway, because they know that it is going to be many hours of standing around walking, uh, they feel that uh, this has been managed very well. They have wristbands with numbers on them. So if they need to leave the queue, they can pop back in to the place that they have left and nobody Nobody queue jumps or even has the prospect of queue jumping if they would even want to because the system is working well. But people are really making friends with each other. They've been talking to each other in the hours and hours that they've been walking together. And there are groups of friends forming, forming uh, over those hours. And it seems like they've been together for much longer, but they have only just met uh, just in the last few hours. Uh, our correspondent John Maguire has been talking to some of the people who have been queuing all morning. From across the United Kingdom and around the globe, they came and they waited and they queued. All for this, a fleeting but significant moment, a chance to say goodbye not just to a monarch but to a woman 
who meant so much to so many. Catherine had flown in from the United States just to be here today. Very emotional um, and very poignant, very touching um, to see everyone go in and pay their respects. And you can just feel the love that everyone has for her. Other journeys weren't as far, but no less important. She had compassion, empathy, forgiveness and love. And I think that has given more to the world than anything. If only other leaders could be that way, wouldn't we live in a wonderful place? It was amazing. I wouldn't have missed it. It was worth waiting 11 hours. It really was. I thought to myself, I'll never see her again. So this was the opportunity that I wanted to go and pay my respects. Maureen and her daughter Emmeline made the decision to come this morning and entered via the accessible queue. She got you through your life, didn't she, yeah. Mum? Yeah, so we're here on behalf of our whole family, aren't yes. we? Past and present. <laughs> Along the two-mile queue that straddles both sides of the River Thames, there are volunteers on hand to help. Multi-faith teams are here to offer support and solace. This morning, the Archbishop of Canterbury joined them after playing a leading role in recent days. And the idea of coming to see people here today? Well, I see how people are, where they've come from. Most people are in very good shape. I had a couple of conversations yesterday where the process had renewed their sense of grief over their own losses. Yes, I've heard that a lot, yes. And, and, you know, that, and particularly coming out, chaplains have found that. Leading politicians will have been in Westminster Hall many times, but never before, to pay their respects to their monarch. By day and by night, they will continue to come over the next few days, compelled by their own reasons, with their own stories, but with one thing in common, their desire to say thank you and to say goodbye. John Maguire, BBC News, Westminster. And once they have got through the long queue, this is what awaits them. Let's show you inside Westminster Hall as they file through. People have been coming out and uh, talking about what their experience was like, but they file through past the Queen's coffin, which is on a raised platform known as a catafalque. It is draped in the royal standard with the orb and scepter placed on top and uh, the imperial state crown. It has a Cullinan II diamond cut from the largest diamond in the world, and uh, that is all beneath the spectacular 11th century hall's medieval timber roof. And each corner of that platform guarded in a continuous vigil by soldiers from units that serve the royal household. And that guard changes every 20 minutes, and that in itself is quite a sight. So what's it like for the people who've been through that experience, queuing for hours, then going through Westminster Hall, paying their respects? Our correspondent, David Cornock, is there for us with uh, some of the people who have come out, David. Yes, good afternoon. I'm at Carriage Gates at the north exit of Westminster Hall. People are emerging now, having paid their respects. I'm delighted to say three of them are with me now. Now, Dave, you've come all the way from Burnley to join a queue, a long queue. Why was it so important to you to be here? That's correct. I travelled down last night. been awake for about 36 hours uh, to come and pay my last respects to the lady that has been my monarch, my colonel-in-chief, and I think probably the world's most wonderful matriarch. And what was it like for you in that fleeting moment inside the hall? Calm, quiet, serene. Um, but it made me understand the reason I did it. Now, Paul, you've come from uh, Shropshire, uh, from Newport in Shropshire. You brought your son James here. He should be in school, no? He should be, yes. I did phone up this morning and I'm hoping that uh, they understand. But I thought this was really important to bring both the sons down to witness what we just witnessed. Really special. Now, James, you're 13 years old, yes? Yes. Um, and how did you find it in the hall? Um, well, I found it quite... Um, how, I'm not sure how to put the words. Um, scary, but um, at the same time, I felt a lot of pride in myself because, obviously, it's our monarch, it's the Queen, who I greatly respect. Um, 
but at the same time it's me thinking in the background what's going to happen next because we've got our new king but what if he messes up somehow well i've got i i do have passion that he'll do great but at the same time i'm nervous for what's to come next but important for you to be here yes definitely well let's hope the school is understanding james paul and dave thank you both thank you all very much indeed back to you David, thank you very much. David Cornart there, just not far from where we are in this part of Westminster. But away from London, as we've been seeing, the Prince and Princess of Wales, William and Catherine, have been at Sandringham in Norfolk today. To see the tributes left there for the Queen, the royal residence was packed with family memories for Her Majesty, and it gave her the chance to indulge her love of simple pleasures like walking the dogs or taking tea with the Women's Institute. Joe Black went to find out more. While much of the focus has been in Scotland and London, here in Norfolk on the Sandringham estate is a growing blanket of flowers, a declaration of people's affection, admiration and appreciation for the late monarch. Where is the Queen? asks three-year-old Matilda. She's up in the clouds, she's told by her mum Charlotte. She has got me, yeah. The Queen was very important, wasn't she? She played a big part in everybody's lives, didn't she? But now, where is the Queen now? Uh, in in the heaven, sky. yeah, in the sky. She's gone. She's gone to rest. It's very emotional and it's really, you know, really feels as though it's a, a proper place to be on a day like this and a time like this. You know, they're going to learn about at school, so, um, you know, we can tell them they've been bought flowers and, you know, so that they've been and you know, laid some little flowers for the Queen. The late Queen was, was able, when she was at Sandringham, to, you know, to drive around the, the estate, to be very much the lady with the headscarf on and, 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 the, and the, the, the tartan skirt, and to go and see her foals being born, to walk her dogs around, uh, and, and indeed to, to go to the, the WI, to, into her local shop. The royal family is set off from Sandringham House to inspect the splendid crops being harvested on the King's estate in Norfolk. This part of Norfolk and its surrounding areas held a particular place in the Queen's affections. Her father, King George VI, loved it here. This footage from 1943 shows him and the then Princess Elizabeth on a family bike ride to inspect the harvest. Like Balmoral, the private residence at Sandringham allowed the monarch time to relax. She and her family spent Christmas here and in January, as president, she would attend the WI meeting. She'd sign the minutes, read annual reports, and one year even went to a very dark village hall on the day of a power cut. These meetings gave the Queen a couple of hours to chat with fellow members and enjoy some light refreshments. She would pour the tea for them and offer them the cakes. And we'd just all chat amongst ourselves and then a little while later the chair would sort of go back a little bit and the handbag would come up and the lipstick would come out and that was the cue to the lady in waiting we were getting ready to move and that really in a nutshell is a meeting it's magical i mean however many times you do it it's still like doing the first one it was very odd and very, it's like a miracle, really. Since the Queen's death, the pupils at Sandringham and West Newton Primary School have been reflecting on their memories of meeting her and other members of the royal family, often at the estate's churches or events like the annual flower show. I'm very pleased that I did get to meet her and I feel proud that I actually got the chance because a lot of people don't get the chance to meet some of the royal family. Well, she gave us all a bit of a wave and she's really kind and gentle um, she asked how the school was getting on um, I think I responded that it was getting on really nice and I was really enjoying it. You've met the future king and that's obviously quite a thing isn't it? Mm. How are you feeling knowing you've already met him? I feel happy and I feel like proud a bit. Since Queen Elizabeth's death was announced around a hundred thousand people have traveled here to pay their respects to bid farewell and say thank you. For many people here, she was a neighbour, the sovereign who loved this part of Norfolk. Joe Black, BBC News, on the Sandringham Estate. 
Well, from another part of the UK to the impact of the loss of the Queen on other parts of the world. Let's go to Canada because uh, Canadian MPs have returned to hold an extraordinary session of Parliament to commemorate the Queen. Our correspondent, uh, Barbara Plett Usher, is outside Canada's Parliament in Ottawa. And uh, Barbara, just tell us what's happening. That's right. They have come back from their summer recess to hold a special session to pay tribute to the Queen. And um, every party leader will be giving a speech, followed by any members of Parliament who would like to talk. The Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, has already been speaking. Uh, he has talked about um, how much the Queen has meant to Canada. He said it wasn't a surprise that she passed away because of her age, but actually her absence was being felt in so many ways because she was on Canadian coins. Her portraits were up. People had listened uh, to her speeches at Christmas. He also injected a personal note saying he had met her from when he was a little boy in 1977 when his father was Prime Minister and that he had uh, very much enjoyed uh, his encounters with her, that she had given him good advice. He really appreciated her sense of humor, which is one thing that made her uh, one of his favorite people in the world. And he noted that Canadians had basically kind of many of them grown up alongside her, that the first time that she had appeared in an official way in Canada was on a postage stamp when she was nine years old. And then one of the last things she did in an official capacity was send her uh, condolences and regrets about uh, a deadly knife attack in Saskatchewan, which happened very shortly before she died. So he has been giving uh, an effusive tribute to the Queen, and we will be hearing from uh, the other leaders of the parties the, uh, in in Parliament, the Conservative and National Democratic and uh, Bloc Québécois leaders, as well as uh, members of Parliament after that. Barbara, a big impact on Canadian leaders and MPs. Uh, what did the Queen mean to ordinary Canadians? How beloved a figure was she? She was very widely respected and appreciated. Um, opinion polls had consistently shown uh, a very strong majority of people who had uh, very, uh, who, who, who thought very highly of her. And the last poll was taken just a, a few months ago, uh, and it reflected that uh, once again. And they, she visited the country 22 times. She went to the different provinces. She uh, was very familiar with the country. Um, she was here at uh, highlights, uh, the, the, the centennial, the Olympics, the repatriation of the Constitution. Um, so she was quite a fixture in the lives of most Canadians who is, she was the only monarch uh, they have known. It has to be said, though, that polls also show uh, a declining support for the monarchy itself. Um, a majority say that it doesn't really feel relevant anymore. Um, ha having said that, though, there have been no protests against it and no uh, organized movement to end the monarchy now that she has passed away. So uh, it looks as if that will continue um, for the time being. Although, again, I have to say that polls show that uh, her successor, uh, King Charles, is not very popular in Canada. So, so that may have an impact going forward as well. Barbara, thank you very much. Barbara Plett Usher outside the Canadian Parliament there in Ottawa back to here in London, outside the Parliament, here and inside Westminster Hall, where we believe uh, the changing of the guard has uh, just been going on there. It happens every 20 minutes among those soldiers who are there, their duty to hold vigil at all four corners of the platform. The Queen's coffin is on. Guarded in that continual vigil from units that serve the royal household. So that, as well as the sight of uh, the Queen lying there in rest, quite something for all the people here. Coming in those queues for hours and hours outside Westminster, along the Thames, and then back east along the south bank of the Thames. Karen, it's uh, struck me, and you've commented on it, just how quiet London is, even amongst these incredible queues, the number of people, and yet the respect and the, the silence is, is just palpable. 
It's very strange being down here with such a lot of people, but such little noise because the traffic's been stopped all around here. That's one thing. But there are thousands and thousands of people outside here on the greens all around Westminster and uh, all along the Thames. And so many police and other people and security forces, army and their vehicles, busloads of police arriving. But it's so quiet and people are chatting. People are in very good moods in the queue, although they are emotional. But uh, there is a, there's a sombre atmosphere, but it's a very respectful atmosphere as well. And uh, it's, it's a very patient one. Nobody is complaining. Not a single word of complaint about the hours and hours of waiting and walking and how people's feet must hurt and how much they must want to sit down. There are people in there with toddlers. There was a man pushing a pram with a three-year-old and by his side he had his five-year-old son and they had done five, six hours in the queue and the children weren't even complaining. So it's really quite something. You must have a magic touch. I'm sure I couldn't have managed yep. it. <laughs> Karen, thank you very much. Uh, Karen Giannone with uh, the latest from Westminster. Well, we're joined now by one of the people organising the massive volunteer operations that are going on to support people in that enormous queue on the way to see the Queen lying in state. CJ Ledger is Deputy Commissioner of the Scouts. And of course, CJ, we would expect uh, you and your volunteers to be extremely well prepared. How many people have you managed to rally to the cause? So um, um, it's such an honour for the Scouts to be involved in such a special and an important occasion. Um, we've got over 120 18 to 25 year old Scouts on the ground helping in the queues and a support team of about 50 further adult volunteers and staff who are supporting behind the scenes, making it all happen. Um, yeah, we've, had, we've been planning for a while and it was a privilege when we got the call last week to, to ask and to be involved and to support the people who are queuing. What exactly are they doing? What are the duties of the volunteers? So we've got uh, Scouts involved in three main areas. Uh, firstly, we're supporting people with the accessibility queue. So people who have additional requirements to make sure that they have an equal um, ability to, to take part in the lying in state. Um, and that's everything from supporting with wheelchair access and uh, British Sign Language uh, translators and all sorts of different accessibility requirements. We're also over the river um, at Archbishop's Park where the bag drop facility is. And again, helping people um, who've got large luggage uh, to keep that secure and safe um, whilst they're in the final part of the queue. And then where the bulk of our volunteers are, are is in the last part of the queue in, in Victoria Park Gardens. And lots of different things there from welfare requirements to um, getting people ready to go through security. Um, and one of the things that as people get ready to go through, they will need to do is make sure they don't have any liquids or food in their bags. Um, so we've been collecting up lots of liquids and foods. Um, and actually, because there's been so much food collected on open packets of, uh, and snacks and things, um, this morning we made an arrangement with one of the local food banks. We got in touch with the Phoenix Project, project uh, to make sure that all of that unopened food doesn't go to waste. And uh, our morning shift, which have just come off duty, collected over 40 bags of food this morning. So we're really proud also to be helping others in the community as well. What an excellent way of disposing of food that nobody wants. Um, I mean, these are quite big responsibilities for young people. How can keen were they to take part? Uh, we had the we sent the call out on Friday evening and by Saturday lunchtime we had over 500 18 to 25 year olds from across the UK who were really keen to get involved and support so it, it was quite a hard and tough job to make the decision to uh, to, to choose 120 to come forward but we, we tried to spread that out so we've got people from across the UK all of our English uh, counties in fact one of our scouts who's a British scout overseas in Luxembourg has even flown into travel so they arrived uh, in London on Tuesday morning Monday night into Tuesday morning so we could do some training and pre preparation with them um, and then we've had them on on shift from 7 a.m yesterday morning uh, in groups of 40 with 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 several other volunteer support leaders as well and of course the queues are round the clock so how, how long are the support is the support available from the volunteers yeah, so we've we're, we've been on shift since 7 a.m. yesterday morning, just before the queue opened, and we'll be on shift right through until after um, 7 a.m. on Monday morning when the official lying-in state uh, public queues close. 
um, so we've got a three shift rotor for eight hours on duty in London and then making sure people are fed and they've got time to sleep and um, have got accommodation just outside London in our national headquarters of Gilwell Park. So lots of preparation happening back there, making sure that, as I say, they've got all food food provided throughout the day uh, by a brilliant team and also people to wash their uniforms and keep it ironed so a lovely a group of people who are keeping everyone nice and smart and tidy as well gosh you think of everything you really do um now i know from my own experience in the the, the brownies uh, that um, organizations like yours are very good at, at giving people awards certificates badges when they perform acts of service like this? I mean, how are you going to recognise the efforts that these young people have made? Oh, well, it's a, it's a great question. I, I, there is part of it which, you know, we all promise as members of the Scouts to, to do our duty to the, to the Queen and, and now the King and to help other people. So it's just part of what we do. However, of course, we, we want to recognise all of those who have gone above and beyond at this really important and special time for the country. So I don't want to give too much away at the moment, but yeah, we are working on a number of different things to make sure that all those who've been involved both in London, but also at local events which have been organised by the Lord Lieutenancies and councils, which have also had scouts involved across the UK, um, we're able to recognise everyone who's had a part in this very important time. Well, if it's a badge, I'm sure it'll be worn with pride. CJ Ledger, uh, Deputy UK Chief Commissioner of the Scouts, thank you very much for talking to us and uh, good luck to all of them and uh, keeping all of those uniforms neat and tidy is no mean feat. Thank you watching uh, BBC News, it's half past three. A Ukrainian government advisor says around a thousand dead bodies have been found in the recently liberated city of Izium, which had been under Russian occupation for months. The number of dead in Izium hasn't been officially announced or independently verified. The city has been heavily damaged by shelling. From Kiev, Hugo Bachega sent this report. This is what the Russians left behind in Izium, a key city now back in Ukrainian hands. Almost nothing remains untouched by the war. These are the visible scars. What lies beneath, it's still not clear. Bodies are being found and allegations of torture are emerging. The horrors of life under occupation. We were staying in the basements without food and water. Russia was providing humanitarian help and initially I refused to take it. To be honest, I didn't want to take anything from Russia, but we had nothing to eat. We had to survive. Ukraine is pressing ahead. It says all invaded territory will be taken back. It knows it won't be easy, but it feels it's got the momentum. Here, a show of defiance, a visit by President Zelensky with the front line just miles away. His message was as clear as ever. You see that Russia is destroying, and you see the mass of the stretch again. But the main thing that we are coming back and we are on the way to the end. But Russia is fighting back. Perhaps it's no coincidence that this time they attacked the president's hometown. A dam was hit and residents had to evacuate. Ukraine's advancing Kharkiv has been stunning. Officials say an area larger than the Count of Devon was recaptured in just a few days. But what happens next? In the south, the situation is said to be more difficult. There, the top prize is the city of Kherson. As many as 20,000 Russian troops are believed to be holding up with limited supplies. After pushing the Russians out of the northeast, the Ukrainians hope to do the same elsewhere. Much will depend on what this man decides to do. President Putin today arrived in Uzbekistan for talks with regional leaders. At the top of the agenda, a meeting with President Xi of China. For the Kremlin, the visit is designed to show that Russia isn't isolated and the Western sanctions haven't worked. But with his army and the economy in trouble, the world is waiting to see his next move. Hugo Mashega, BBC News, Kiev. Sport now, full roundup from the BBC Sports Centre. Let's join Laura. Hello. Hi, Martin. Good afternoon, everyone. Roger Federer has announced he is to retire from tennis after next week's Lever Cup in London. The 20-time Grand Slam winner says it's a bittersweet decision, but there is so much to celebrate. He thanked his family and fans. Andy Swiss joins me now. I mean, one of the greatest ever tennis players set to retire. Another great retiring in the last 
couple of weeks. Well, that's right. Where do you begin with Roger Federer? Not just one of the greats of tennis, but one of the greats of world sport. But as he said in his statement, he is now 41 years old. He's not played a competitive match since he was knocked out of the quarterfinals at Wimbledon last summer. And it seems that the knee injury, which has been plaguing him really in recent years, has finally got the better of him. But he is one of the most successful tennis players uh, that the sport has ever seen. He won the men's singles at Wimbledon eight times more than any other man in history. He was really the king of centre court. He first won it back in 2003. That was the first of five Wimbledon titles in a row. He last won it, won it in uh, 2017 amidst hugely emotional scenes. He won 20 Grand Slam titles in total, uh, six Australian Opens, eight Wimbledons, five US Opens, one French Open. Only Rafael Nadal and Novak Djokovic have more Grand Slam titles than that in the men's game. But as I say, he has suffered with injuries yes. over recent years. He was world number one, member for the best part of six years in his prime. But over the last few seasons, we have seen him struggling more and more with injuries. And he says that next week's Labour Cup, a team event uh, which is taking place in London, will be his final event in competitive tennis. And as you mentioned, this, of course, comes just after the retirement of Serena Williams. So uh, tennis has seen the retirement of two of its greatest players in history in just a matter of weeks. Yes, they have indeed. And just hearing all of that, you just realise how much of a tremendous career he really had. Thank you very much, Andy Swiss, for that analysis. Now, with the World Cup just over two months away, England manager Gareth Southgate has named his squad for the final round of games in the Nations League. And amongst the 28-man squad is Brentford's Ivan Toney, who gets his first call-up to the senior side. The striker has scored five goals in six league matches so far this season. Goalkeeper Dean Henderson is also recalled for the upcoming matches against Italy and Germany. Manchester United's Marcus Rashford misses out after picking up an injury. Meanwhile, Northern Ireland manager Ian Barraclough has included a new face in his squad. Kofi Balmer gets his first call-up for the matches against Kosovo and Greece later this month. Northern Ireland have gone 14 matches without a win in the competition and have currently just two points from four games. England's one-day captain Joss Butler says he and his teammates want to honour the Queen during their historic tour of Pakistan. The squad arrived in the country earlier today ahead of seven T20 internationals, the first of which gets underway on Tuesday. It's the first time England have toured Pakistan in 17 years and Butler hopes they can make the Queen proud. Her Majesty the Queen passing, we were, um, obviously was deeply saddened by that. I think we could have seen the reaction, especially at, at home in England, to her passing. And, and um, you know, I think yeah, cricket did a fantastic job at the Oval um, you know, to, to honour her and, and the way that game was, was played. And um, you know, some special scenes watching on, on the TV. So uh, we hope to honour her in, in our own way as a, a T20 team and, and play in a fashion um, you know, to do that. Scotland have named their 32-player squad as they prepare for their first Women's Rugby World Cup since 2010. Head coach Brian Eason has included 19-year-old Emma Orr, who only made her debut in the Six Nations earlier this year. Rachel Malcolm will captain Scotland, who are in Pool A, alongside New Zealand, Australia and Wales. The tournament gets underway in early October. That's all the sport for now. I'll be back in an hour with another update. Martine. Laura, thank you very much. Let's uh, reflect now on one of the Queen's passions, horses. The Queen's racing stables turned out some 1,700 winners and she only missed two Epsom derbies in her entire reign. Joining us now from California is Monty Roberts, a horse trainer who knew the Queen for more than three decades, known as the Horse Whisperer. Monty Roberts, it's a treat to speak to you here on the BBC News Channel. How did you come to work with... The Queen Elizabeth. How did it feel to work for Queen Elizabeth? Um, how does the best thing in your life feel? Um, it's just unbelievable what God did to pull us together and uh, bring us into a friendship that started in 1989 and uh, proceeded until the loss of Her Majesty. Recently, um, COVID bit into our last uh months of our existence but wow what an advantage i had over everybody in the world when i was working with horses um for her majesty it became 
the center of, of my work. How did it come about? It came about, um, if you look behind me, there's a log here that Ronald Reagan cut for me. And Ronald Reagan and the Queen through the 80s, they were doing things like riding horses along the river and stuff. And Ronald Reagan had horses in training with me here in California at the time. And he was quite a fan of it all. But I became a fan of his going to England and riding with the Queen on the horses. And Ronald Reagan could really ride well. I was a cowboy, but I also showed in show jumping and and uh, hunter work. So I, I had a broad base of horsemanship. And it um, I, I guess it made me jealous that Ronald Reagan was getting to ride with the Queen along the river. And then we had an open house here. And we did a, a thing for the trainers of mostly California. But two journalists wrote articles about this open house. And uh, those articles, one from Florida and one from California, ended up on the Queen's desk. And she read them. And it was crazy because I was causing horses to accept their first saddle and rider in less than 30 minutes. And that can't be done. It takes four to six weeks and anybody knows that. But the queen read these and gave them to her horse manager, Sir John Miller, and said, read these two articles and let me know what you think. And he came back and threw them down and said, it's hogwash. It's a, <laughs> it's a fake. Um, and she said, really? Well, the Queen had ridden horses throughout the Second World War time when she was just a little girl at uh, Windsor Castle. And she had an idea that I was right about taking the violence out of training horses. So she said, why don't you go to California and watch this and then give me a call and say whether it's worthwhile to bring this Roberts guy over here to Windsor Castle. And so Sir John Miller came here to see a, a phony set of training, but he saw a real set of training. And he went so far as to say, let me pick a horse from your group and have you do it. And I did that. And he said, what are you doing in June of 89 or uh, April of 89? And I said, what do you want me to do in April of 89? Well, he said, I think the queen is going to want to see this. So the next thing, you no, know, I, Pat and I received an invitation from Buckingham Palace to go to uh, the Windsor Castle in April, early April of 89. And the Queen got 23 horses out in front of her bedroom. And they kept me 20 miles away at Sir John Miller's house. So I couldn't go near the horses to make it a phony thing. But anyway, those 23 horses were done in five days to accept their first saddle and rider. And the stories abound about how people told her, oh no, it's a fake, it's a fake. And she kept pushing. God works in funny ways to bring me Ronald Reagan and then bring me the queen because of Ronald Reagan. And um, one of the first things the queen asked me to do was to go for a ride with her along the river by Windsor Castle. And uh, I knew that she'd already ridden this same path with Ronald Reagan before, so we had a lot to talk about with the horses we were riding and the corgis running around us at the same time. It was incredible. We rode by one of the big gates leading into Windsor Castle, and there was an elderly lady there with her arms through the bars on the gate saying, Yoo-hoo, yoo-hoo, your majesty. Oh, no, she said, Yoo-hoo, yoo-hoo, uh, lady, lady. And I'm riding beside the queen. And uh, the lady said, do you work here? And the queen stopped her horse and turned and said, I certainly do. And then rode off. And I said, <laughs> your majesty, that poor lady does, will never know that she spoke with the queen of England. Oh, she said, I can't talk to everybody. So come on. And we had horses to do. So then it was that solid week of working with horses, 23 of them. And then what do you think the queen did? She set up 30 days for Pat and I to go in her car, all up and down England, Scotland, Wales, the Isle of Man, and Northern Ireland, with 98 horses to do. And um, 
21 stops along the way, and then an hour meeting afterward. And that hour meeting represents the first time we really got into being friends with one another and investigating things that would help us. She one gave of the you, things I, I, believe she, I believe she gave you an honour in uh, 20, oh, 2012. I mean, it sounds like you really earned it, Monty, I have to say. Well, I, I guess I did earn it. That's OK. Um, that came to me in 2012. But um, the things that happened before 2012 were just off the charts. She said there has to be a book. It was on the New York Times bestseller list for 58 weeks. She said, you have to go to other countries and take this to the world. And I took it to 41 countries. Um, without a failure of any horse in 41 countries, I'm probably in the range of 3,000 horses. Um, the luck I've had after meeting the queen is, is just off the charts. And the loss of the queen is a deep, deep sorrow for me. But at the same time, none of us have beaten this thing called life. And uh, they're telling me now to let her go. And I'm not going to let her go. I'm going to continue to do as long as I can the things that Her Majesty wanted me to do. She loved animals, her corgis, her horses. And even we sat at lunch in the gardens of Windsor Castle and the budgies were released. I didn't know what a budgie was, but they're pretty little birds. And she loved to have them flying around when we had lunch there in the gardens. And Terry Pendry, a student of mine, had gone to work already for Her Majesty. And he said, oh, no, did she release the budgies again? You know, they're all over London and we have to go try to catch them and put them back in her cage. But she she loved her animals uh, down to the fact that she even loved her budgies. Well, you've obviously got some wonderful, wonderful memories. I've seen Horse Whispering carried out by Kelly Marks in Oxfordshire, I believe, trained with you, so I know it's not hogwash. Monty Roberts, thank you very much for talking to us here on the BBC News Channel. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> He's welcome. Could have talked all day. The Treasury is considering removing a cap on bankers' bonuses as part of a post-Brexit shake-up of the City of London rules. The BBC has been told that no final decisions have been made, but the Chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng, is considering it as a way of making London a more attractive place for global banks to do business. A little earlier, I spoke to our business editor, Simon Jack, about what the cap could mean. This was introduced in 2014 and it limits bankers' bonuses to two times their base pay, introduced after the financial crisis as a way of trying to limit the amount of excessive risk-taking, which many people thought spawned the crisis. Now, what it did to banks is to keep bankers in the manner to which they were accustomed. They actually raised their basic pay so that they would basically get to where they were before. And that was bad for banks, they thought, because it meant that my fixed costs go up. I'm less able to dial up or dial down pay based on the profits or losses of the company. So the banks think it's a good idea to keep them, to, to, to be able to marry the profitability of the firm and the actual money I pay out. So the removal of the cap then might appeal to them. What's being mooted? What's being mooted is the economic case, from the, as far as the Chancellor is concerned, is that if you do this, something the banks actually quite like, then they would put more business into the UK, and in particular London. More business means more economic activity, means more growth, which they're very focused on, and ultimately more tax. Although I have to say the economic case for that is not universally accepted. A lot of people think that actually the amount of tax the financial services sector has paid has been pretty stable, both before the cap and after the cap, so not a slam dunk in terms of the actual economic impact, but obviously politically, it's a, a real hot potato. What is the connection to it being in a post-Brexit era that this is happening? Well, so it was an EU-wide policy that was introduced, and when we left the EU, all these regulations were basically moved en masse onto the UK statute books. So it is there, it is there to be got rid of if people like. And so a lot of people say, look, this could be seen as a Brexit win. It's in the pro-growth strategy of the Chancellor. You could chalk it up and say, here's something we could do, which we couldn't do before. But politically, maybe at this particular moment, lifting the lid on bankers' pay when people are struggling with the cost of living crisis, and do those red wall seats that um, were Brexit dividends were promised to, was this top of their list, lifting bankers' pay? Probably not. So I think it's going to be very controversial. 
there's differing views on how determined the government are to do this. Some people say they're flying a kite to see how it goes down. Politically, I don't think it's going to go down particularly well. The timing's pretty bad. Um, but the government has really put, nailed its colours to the mast, saying anything that promotes more activity, more growth, we're in favour of. Um, as I say, very controversial at a time when many people are facing crushing uh, cost of living. But more risk as well, potentially. Yes, but what they, what they say is that after the financial crisis, a number of other regulations came in to try and limit risk. For example, senior people at these banks can now be held, held personally and potentially criminally responsible for any misconduct, whilst they, any excessive risk taking and misconduct. Um, and and that, that would uh, be a disincentive to that. Um, and so other regulations have um, arrived to take its place. But like I say, it is of the bankers I speak to, it is not top of their list. They think actually, quite like having higher basic pay. Makes my life, my, my income more stable, bit of a quiet life, don't have to work quite so hard to get that bonus at the end of the year. But the banks do quite like it because, as I say, it allows them to uh, calibrate pay along with success or failure. Um, but yeah, it's going to be a hot potato for sure. Yep. And the unions hate it. And a lot of, you know, a lot of other people say it's an insult to other workers. Simon Jack, our business editor. So let's just talk about this a little bit further with the director of the think tank High Pay Centre, Luke Hildyard. Luke, thanks very much for joining us. What's good about the idea of removing this bonus cap in your view? Well, the idea is, as Simon just said, that it will uh, make things easier for banks to uh, increase pay as profits increase and reduce it if, uh, if, if they decrease. Um, so from that perspective, it, you know, it's good for their, for their business models. Uh, the, the disadvantages are, and again, I think Simon put this very well, it's not really a, uh, in its current form a cap on pay, it's a cap on risk. So they can still pay the, uh, their staff as much as they like. They just can't give them a bonus any bigger than double their annual salary. Prior to the um, introduction of the cap, uh, typical bonuses for uh, top bankers were about five times their salary, according to data from the European Banking Authority. And around that time, you were seeing things like obviously the financial crisis, LIBOR manipulation, foreign currency exchange manipulation, big scandals in the banking industry that possibly came, at least in part, from people um, throwing their ethics out of the window in pursuit of hitting a target that was get, then going to uh, lead to a mega bonus. So I think that will be the, uh, the real concern uh, that people have with, with lifting the cap. We haven't actually seen any, any, scale, any scandals on quite those, uh, those scales since the, the cap came in in 2014. But there are, as Simon has also said, there are other measures in place which might limit the risk taking that we've seen in the past. Yes, I think in practice, things like clawback and personal liability are pretty difficult to apply. Um, there are very few people who've, uh, you know, who've ended up in, in jail over the, uh, over the financial crisis and the uh, things like the LIBOR manipulation, foreign currency manipulation scandals. So I'd be quite sceptical as to whether they can actually, uh, you know, compensate for the, um, for the disincentive to excess risk that would be, that we'd be losing if, if, we, uh, if we lost the cap. Luke Hildyard from the High Pay Centre, thank you very much for talking to us. Queen Elizabeth II was not only one of the most photographed and filmed women in the world, she was also portrayed on stage and screen by many different actors, including some of our most celebrated talents. Our arts correspondent Rebecca Jones has been through the archives to hear how some of them tackled the role. The many faces of the monarch as portrayed on screen. But for each one of the actresses who've played Elizabeth II, the challenge has been the same, capturing the spirit of a woman famous for giving so little away. Dame Helen Mirren won an Oscar for her role as Elizabeth II in The Queen. I watch the documentaries that the rest of us have watched, and, uh, but I watch them in a particular kind of way, seeing little moments. Into the specially decorated royal box. There's a wonderful moment, I was just watching it recently, she's at Balmoral, and she's presenting an award, and, um, and obviously one of the caper tossers has just said something that really makes her laugh, and she just does this wonderful 
gesture, she rocks right back on her heels, right back, brings her arms forward, enjoying the moment kind of way. And uh, it's just little moments like that, you see. Ah. The clues are in the gestures and the voice too. Claire Foy played the younger Elizabeth in the first two series of The Crown. It's not as easy as it looks. That's exactly what the King said. The um, broadcasts that she did and the speeches that she did at the time, her voice was very, very high. Very high. I am proud to have inspected you today in this, the year of my coronation. And I think it would have been too much to go in that direction um, because we, we never wanted it to be a caricature or um, a kind of impression. Just remember who you're standing in for when I'm gone. My characterless sister. Your queen. The role of the queen in the crown passed to Olivia Coleman. And faith and truth I will bear unto thee. For her, interpreting Elizabeth II's inscrutability meant a lot of guesswork. Her training, I suppose, means that she has to be stoic and strong. She's a rock for, for the nation, so you never, you never see really what's what she's thinking. Yeah. Which is eternally fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Many actresses may have portrayed Elizabeth II on film and television, but the starring role in the life of the nation was always played by the Queen herself. Rebecca Jones, BBC News. Well, as the nation and people across the world mourn the loss of Queen Elizabeth II, the BBC has set up a web page where viewers and listeners can share their memories and pay tribute. You can send your tributes in words, still pictures or video by email. The address is yourqueen at bbc.co.uk or you can use WhatsApp on plus four four seven seven five six one six five eight zero three. Those details are on the screen right now and they're also on our website, which also has a contact form that you can fill in. Time for a look at the weather forecast now with Helen. It feels a little fresher out and about today and the reason is a change in wind direction. We're now pulling the winds down from the north behind various weather systems bringing showers and that northerly wind is introducing Arctic air right the way across the United Kingdom which means it'll be our first significant chilly snap of the autumn. Quite a windy spell as well. Those winds are quite blustery in the north and the east, pulling in lots of showers for Scotland, one or two in the east. The odd one further west as well, coming down the Cheshire Plains into the northwest Midlands. But you can see those temperatures on a par with yesterday in the north, but notably lower further south. And that's worth bearing in mind if you are coming to London because it will feel quite chilly around the buildings, in particular with that blustery wind. There could be a shower the outside chance of a shower tomorrow, but it is largely fine and dry. But through the evenings and into the nighttime period, that's when we'll really notice that chill. In fact, uh, frost is in the forecast further north over the coming few nights as well. And so the wider picture is one of showers continuing through the night and temperatures falling lower. But the winds will be a bit stronger, strengthening still actually through the course of this night. So therefore fewer mist and fog problems, but we'll have a touch of grass frost in the glens of Scott and even further south, temperatures into single figures. So it looks to Friday we'll see a bit more sunshine, but probably a few more showers getting into eastern parts of England and a stronger wind here, really quite blustery. But as the day goes on, it's likely to start to ease further west. So although there will still be the chance of a few showers in the west, probably fewer than today, and the winds start to ease a little here as the high pressure starts to build in. But you can see again tomorrow, mid to high teens, the temperatures for most of us just a little bit below where they should be for this time of year. Now through the weekend, we get this little weather front, a weak weather front as it comes into that high pressure. But we still keep high pressure around, so there's still quite a lot of dry and settled clear weather Friday night into Saturday. So that's where we could have a touch of frost even further south in rural spots, but it'll be very isolated. But it does mean quite a bright start before we get more cloud introduced on our weather front across Scotland. Perhaps some heavier rain here for a time, but then as it meanders southwards during Saturday night and Sunday, it will tend to peter out. But a lot of dry weather once again around during both Saturday and Sunday. And as ever, we'll keep you updated.
Watching BBC News, here are the headlines. Tens of thousands of people queue to pay their respects to Her Majesty the Queen as she lies in state in Westminster Hall in central London. The queue outside is now several miles long and people from all around the country have travelled to join it and say a final farewell. And I'm Chi Chi Zundu, who's joining people walking to Westminster. And it's taken us about three hours and just over two miles, and we've still got several ways to go. I'm Martine Croxall in the BBC studio. In other news, in Ukraine, amid the devastation of conflict, more claims of atrocities committed by Russian troops. What will happen to energy bills next month? We take a look at what the changes might mean for all of us. A splash of pink at the funeral of nine-year-old Olivia Pratt Corbell, killed by a gunman in Liverpool last month. The Chancellor considers removing a cap on bankers' bonuses as part of a post-Brexit shake-up of city rules. Hundreds of people have reported seeing a shooting star across the sky over Scotland and Northern Ireland last night. The 20-time Grand Slam singles champion, Roger Federer, will retire from top-level tennis later this month. Hello and welcome to Westminster. A week after the death of the Queen, where members of the public are queuing to see her lying in state. I'm Sean Leyer. Welcome to you, where you, whether you're joining us from somewhere in the UK or anywhere else around the world. Indeed, many of the people who are coming to pay their respects will have travelled, some from as far as Australia, to, get, to pay those respects to the Queen. The queue at the moment now stretches back about four miles, it's estimated. Royal officials have meanwhile confirmed details for Monday's state funeral for Queen Elizabeth. The service will be held at Westminster Abbey in London before the late Queen is taken to the burial, which will be held at Windsor Castle, a few miles to the west of the capital, a castle where the Queen and her family spent many of their years. She will then be interred with her husband, the late Duke of Edinburgh, in St George's Chapel in what will be a private service at the end of a very long day, 7.30pm on Monday. King Charles, his sister and his brothers will maintain a vigil by the Queen's Coffin in Westminster Hall at 7.30 on Friday evening. Well, those are the arrangements for next week. For now, for this week, at least until the morning of the funeral, Westminster Hall is open to the public. It's an extraordinary building if you've never had the good fortune to be in London to visit it. A giant building with arches above you, stone around you, six foot thick stone walls, first erected back in the year 1097. So for almost a thousand years, the building into which these people are queuing to enter and pay their respects has been at the heart of public life. This is the entrance where they go in. You'll see under the canopies there, which provide some protection along the side of the Palace of Westminster, the normal parliamentary business has been suspended. Of course, 
the British system is based on the Queen in Parliament, or as it now is, the King in Parliament. Westminster Hall began its life just as a banqueting hall, a place to have grand meals for which the King, then William the Conqueror's son, who first commissioned it, would invite uh, nobles and international guests to come and see how impressive he was. Now, though, a much more subdued occasion, one uh, with precedent over the last 100 years, in which monarchs, when they die, are brought to lie in state for family, friends, foreign dignitaries, politicians, and nowadays members of the public too, to pay their respects. Her Majesty the Queen has laid there now since she was brought back to London and she will remain there over the weekend. As I say, we now know that, uh, that King Charles and his sister and brothers will be standing guard, the four of them around the cattle folk. Uh, tomorrow evening. At present, that duty is provided by members of the military, exchanged regularly uh, for obvious reasons, so that they can actually uh, provide that protection for the sovereign's coffin. The hall is open, as I say, public day and night, 24 hours a day. People are queuing to pay their respects, and her coffin uh, is part of that process at the heart of this ceremonial. Let's just pause and enjoy a little of this atmosphere inside Westminster Hall. The coffin is guarded at all hours by units from the Sovereign's bodyguard, the Household Division or Yeoman Warders of the Tower of London, all in position, all in silence, standing erect, many of them heads bowed. Our correspondent Caroline Hawley has more. It's a week since the country learned of Queen Elizabeth's death, a week of national public mourning and of private grief. And right now, thousands upon thousands of people wait patiently to pay their last respects. They've been on their feet all night and there are hours left to go before they'll get to Westminster Hall. The queue, several miles long, snakes along the banks of the River Thames. Wristband, please. Thank you. Wristband. It's been orderly, organised and, by all accounts, a friendly experience. A coming together of people who want to show their gratitude and respect. Look at all these people, you know, it's... Um, they're coming for their Queen. There's even tourists here. We've met so many nice people, so it's, it's been lovely. And I would regret if I didn't come. Absolutely regret. Today is the first full day of the Queen lying in state before her funeral on Monday. Last night, Emily and her two sons arrived in London from Birmingham. Can you remember where the end of the queue is, Freddie? It's London Bridge. London Bridge. Let's go and catch the queue. Yes! Joining people from all corners of the country and all ages. No bedtime, no school today. For them, being here was much too important to miss. We've just come out after seeing Her Majesty. It was absolutely amazing. Awesome. Awesome. Thoroughly worth the six hour wait that we had. In the middle of last night, out of public view, the military was busy rehearsing for its role in this historic moment. Preparations for the Queen's death have been years, decades in the making, meticulous plans now being meticulously practised and finessed. 142 sailors from the Royal Navy will draw the state gun carriage used for Queen Victoria's funeral that will take the Queen's coffin to Westminster Abbey on Monday. Pallbearers even practised their final duty to their former commander-in-chief, carrying an empty black coffin. At 10.44, the Queen's coffin will be taken from Westminster Hall to Westminster Abbey, a solemn journey that will take eight minutes. It was here that she was crowned back in 1953. The funeral service, attended by heads of state from every corner of the globe, starts at 11am. It will be followed by a national two-minute silence. The route of the procession goes past Buckingham Palace and on to Wellington Arch, where her coffin will be transferred into the state hearse.
The late monarch will then be driven by road to Windsor Castle for a more intimate service at St George's Chapel, attended by members of the royal family and staff who served her throughout her reign. She will then be laid to rest in the evening in a private service. At Sandringham in Norfolk today, the Prince and Princess of Wales came to greet well-wishers and to look at the many, many floral tributes to the Queen. Inside Westminster Hall, for these members of the public, the long wait to say goodbye was over. Everyone here with their own feelings, memories, emotions. As the country prepares with pomp and pageantry to bid its final farewell to Britain's longest ever reigning monarch. Caroline Hawley, BBC News. Well, the queues for people arriving at Westminster Hall have stretched throughout today, Thursday, along Lambeth Bridge and the Albert Embankment. Metropolitan police officers, volunteers and stewards who are managing the queue uh, are all along the route when people have question or they need assistance or they just need to know how much longer it is before they're going to get there to see the Queen's coffin. Uh, there are also toilets and water fountains provided at various points. It, this plan has been, uh, of course, in existence really for decades now of what would happen. And certainly in the last few years, it's been constantly refined to try and ensure that it could swing into operation very quickly indeed. Uh, people are very patient. Of course they are in circumstances like this. Uh, and it's a very good atmosphere. It's a very positive atmosphere by all accounts of those who've been in the queue and those who've been reporting on it. People are here for a very positive reason. They've made a choice to come. Because they've made that choice, many of them are prepared to put up with, you know, what are not ideal conditions, inevitably. Long waits, particularly for those who perhaps uh, have uh, a need for extra support. If we go to the other side of the river, we can see that people are actually south of the river and then snaking their way slowly across. You can actually see in that shot both sides of the river. It's a beautiful shot uh, that our colleagues have provided, and it just gives you a sense of the fact that this is a very, very long wait but people are very patient. They've been patient before. When the Queen's father, George VI, uh, lay in state back in 1952, 304,000 people are thought to have queued during the course of those days and nights to pay their respects. In days, of course, when people even dressed up for the occasion, very few of those in those days would have been dressed casually. They would have been in heavy coats and dark colors, women in hats. Times have changed. There's nothing disrespectful at all about coming however you want to come because the point you are making is one of affection, appreciation uh, and a symbol of that uh, long-standing connection between Queen Elizabeth and the people of this country and people who knew her from around the world. Uh, and it's actually quite nice to see that people have come. Some of them are coming for, obviously from work straight from work many people have come others have traveled specially to london others are trying to join a queue knowing that they will have to be very very patient indeed for what is after all only a moment a moment really a moment i suppose for all of us in history isn't it really we have never seen our light before most of us have never seen our light before and there's a good chance we never will again our correspondent john mcguire has been talking to those who have been queuing from across the United Kingdom and around the globe, they came and they waited and they queued. All for this, a fleeting but significant moment, a chance to say goodbye not just to a monarch, but to a woman who meant so much to so many. Catherine had flown in from the United States just to be here today. Very emotional. Um and very poignant, very touching um, to see everyone go in and pay their respects. And you can just feel the love that everyone has for her. Other journeys weren't as far, but no less important. She had compassion, empathy, forgiveness and love. And I think that has given more to the world than anything. If only other leaders could be that way, wouldn't we live in a wonderful place? It was amazing. I wouldn't have missed it. It was worth waiting 11 hours. It really was. I thought to myself, I'll never see her again. So this was the opportunity that I wanted to go and pay my respects. Maureen and her daughter Emmeline made the decision to come this morning 
and entered via the accessible queue. She got you through your life, didn't she, yeah. Mum? Yeah, so we're here on behalf of our whole family, aren't yes. we? Past and present. <laughs> Along the two-mile queue that straddles both sides of the River Thames, there are volunteers on hand to help. Multi-faith teams are here to offer support and solace. This morning, the Archbishop of Canterbury joined them after playing a leading role in recent days. And the idea of coming to see people here today? Well, let's see how people are, where they've come from. Most people are in very good shape. I had a couple of conversations yesterday where the process had renewed their sense of grief over their own losses. Yes, I've heard that a lot, yes. And, and, you know, that, and particularly coming out, chaplains have found that. Leading politicians will have been in Westminster Hall many times, but never before, to pay their respects to their monarch. By day and by night, they will continue to come over the next few days, compelled by their own reasons, with their own stories, but with one thing in common, their desire to say thank you and to say goodbye. John Maguire, BBC News, Westminster. Well, our correspondent Chichi Azundo is with people right at the back of the queue. Chichi, what's the mood there? I mean, presumably many people who have come have just arrived. They know that it's going to be a long wait. It is going to be a long wait, but the queue's moving quite quickly. We've actually made it to the National Gallery. We started off earlier this afternoon in Bermondsey, and that walk was about two miles long, and it's taken us about three miles, uh, sorry, three hours to walk that length. And the queue is moving at quite a pace, and there are some bottlenecks, but it's been quite lovely. People have been chatting, getting to know each other. I've been walking along with Hazel and Michael, Hazel, you came from Bedfordshire because you've actually already met the Queen. I did. I met the Queen in 2016, so I'm a Churchill Fellow, and we were invited to Buckingham Palace for a reception. And I'm, I'm sure, like many other thousands of people in the UK, you, you're really nervous before you meet her, but the minute that her hand touches yours and you see her smile, you know, and, and the light in her eyes, all of those nerves disappear. I can't remember what the conversation was that we had, but it was a very personal moment, which is one of the reasons that I'm here today, as well as being a member of the scouting movement. And Michael, you came for a special reason as well. Yeah, I came from Dublin this morning. Um, my mother, my late mother, had the same, she was born the same year as Her Majesty the Queen, 1926. So that's one of the reasons I'm here. And obviously it's a huge, I think, momentous occasion in history. And I think I'm just delighted to be here to experience the moment. Like three loners, we came all alone and we met in the queue. You two met for the first time. And M Michael, you were concerned about your flight. I did. So um, I booked a flight earlier this week and saying I just have to be here first. So I did the same day return, but I decided to book it back to tomorrow morning, thinking the queues would be long. But as you said, it's moving at quite a pace. So it wasn't a concern as it turned out in the end. And you're going all the way back to Dublin. And Hazel, how have you found this queue over the last three hours? Do you know, it's, it's one of those things that we've seen and experienced ourselves that sometimes it moves quite quickly, but other times when you are pausing to talk to other people, hear their stories and enjoy that conversation, it's been really worthwhile and really rewarding as well. I'm glad I'm here. Because some people were talking about having theatre tickets that they didn't want to miss last uh, tonight, in fact, and they're quite concerned, but you're quite happy that you've actually had this experience. I think it is one of those things that everybody that comes, that queues, that talks to those around, them we all realize that actually that we're really fortunate to be in the UK at this moment in time to say our final goodbyes to our monarch and I have to ask your uniform yes. what is that about so I'm a member of the scouting movement and I'm a scout leader so um, one of the things that we do as part of our promise is we promise to do our duty to the Queen and I feel that's part of my duty being here today to represent not only some of the adults in the movement that can't actually make it that I know but those that I've met overseas um, at the World Scout Jamboree but also my young people that are at school and can't make it as well so it's really important to pay that final tribute to the Queen as a scout as well. And Michael have you given thought to how it will feel when you walk past 
to the actual coffin because it's been really lovely and jovial in the queue. Yeah, I, I can't say, but I suspect it would be quite emotional given the shared connection my mum and she had in terms of birth year. So we'll see how it goes. But um, it's been a great day, as Hazel said. Everybody's having a great time. Um, I know it's a solemn occasion, but it does remind me somewhat of an Irish wake where you obviously have the balance between celebrating the person's life and having those solemn moments. And I think this is one of those occasions where everybody is really up in up with spirits and telling stories about where they've come from and we've learned stuff about our personal lives as well and the weather has held off so that's <laughs> also helps as well a little bit blustery here outside the national theater but the rain has kept off do you think you'll make your flight that's the question well it is tomorrow morning so yes i'll probably make it for dinner somewhere in london tonight so that's the plan <laughs> well hazel and michael thank you very very much for keeping me company in the queue and we will get our places back but we've got still at least another mile left to go but hopefully it won't be much longer and we're estimating we should be in victoria tower gardens around 7 p.m so about three or four more hours of walking left Yes, it's uh, one, for, one day for the walking shoes, isn't it? And maybe that little metre that measures the number of steps you've taken. Chi-Chi, thank you very much. Um, we can talk a little bit uh, and show you some, some shots, actually, not just behind us, but a little to... This is Victoria. Um, we have Victoria Tower in vision. And if we go the other side, you'll see uh, the queue that snakes along by the embankment. It's quite, quite substantial, quite a relaxed atmosphere. People aren't being corralled, um, but they are moving quite fast. It's a, I think it's fair to say with the, the way the different uh, guide ropes have been positioned, you can't go too far wrong and there are plenty of people to make sure you don't go too far wrong. So there is, it's not a kind of heavy handed police or security presence by any means. It's very low key. And don't they say one thing the British are good at is queuing. Uh, we've talked over the last few days not least, of course, we were talking, it feels like a lifetime ago now, doesn't it? Nine days ago, eight days ago, about the Queen's change of Prime Ministers at the beginning of the last week when she met uh, Boris Johnson as he surrendered the seals of office on the Tuesday and then later the same day at Balmoral, Liz Truss, the, Prime Minister, the 15th Prime Minister, uh, to be appointed by the Queen, to be invited to form a government under the British constitutional system. They are the Queen's ministers, and this is the Prime Minister, the Queen's most senior advisor, really. The Queen has still that constitutional role of appointing an individual or inviting them to form a government. Uh, she's had 15 Prime Ministers in the UK. She's had goodness knows how many in the various nations that now or in the past have been under the British crown, but almost none of them, I think, have the kind of memories that Justin Trudeau of Canada has, because he is not only uh, the current Prime Minister of his country, he's the son of a previous Prime Minister, Pierre Trudeau, and he knew the Queen as a boy. So he's very much given the impression of a man who feels this loss particularly closely because of his long memories. He says Canada continues to mourn the loss of the Queen, but also it looks to the future with King Charles III. Our correspondent Barbara Plesh-Usher is outside the Parliament building in Ottawa, where MPs have returned to business early in order to hold a special session in commemoration of the Queen. They have come back from their summer recess to hold a special session to pay tribute to the Queen and um, every party leader will be giving a speech followed by any members of parliament who would like to talk. The Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has already been speaking. Uh, he has talked about um, how much the Queen has meant to Canada. He said it wasn't a surprise that she passed away because of her age, but actually her absence was being felt in so many ways because she was on Canadian coins, her portraits were up, people had listened uh, to her speeches at Christmas. He also injected a personal note saying he had met her from when he was a little boy in 1977 when his father was Prime Minister and that he had uh, very much enjoyed uh, his encounters with her, that she had given him good advice. He really appreciated her sense of humor, which is one thing that made her uh, one of his favorite people in the world. And he noted that Canadians had basically kind of many of them grown up alongside her, that the first time that she had appeared in an official way in Canada was on a postage stamp when she was nine years old. And then one of the last things she did in an official capacity was send her uh, condolences and regrets about uh, a deadly knife attack in Saskatchewan, which happened 
happened very shortly before she died. So he has been giving uh, an effusive tribute to the Queen, and we will be hearing from uh, the other leaders of the parties the, uh, in in Parliament, the Conservative and National Democratic and uh, Bloc Québécois leaders, as well as uh, members of Parliament after that. Barbara Plettasha outside Parliament in Ottawa in Canada. Um, Let's take another look at the outside of Westminster Hall, just by the security uh, entrance. Uh, there's been a much heightened security presence, really, around the Palace of Westminster for probably the last 30 years. But in the last decade or so, we've had uh, much more additional, much heavier security, all the barriers to stop the risks of car bombs being driven into the building, uh, individual security checks, because of course people can visit the Palace of Westminster when it's not actually sitting, and others visit when they go to see their MPs or invited as a guest by an MP or a member of the House of Lords. Uh, it, it, but the security aspect of this is quite interesting because part of the history of Westminster Hall is actually, would you believe, as a law court. Uh, and it's all to do with Magna Carta. When Magna Carta, when reluctantly King John was forced to sign Magna Carta back in the 1300s, one of the conditions was that there had to be a permanent place where judges sat. The courts couldn't just be called when the king wanted them and then not be there when the king didn't. Otherwise, how could people go and plead their case, or indeed plead a case against the king, shock horror. Now, uh, because it was, of course, the king's justice. So there was a permanent location, and inside the building, just where we are now, they are actually, I think, in the process of changing uh, the, uh, uh, the soldiers who are standing guard. So that's why we, I think we saw the step down. Uh, that process obviously has to be done regularly, and it's done with great discipline and great ceremony. Uh, and we can see two members of the present government, Alistair Jack, who is the Secretary of State for Scotland, and Ben Wallace, who is the Defence Secretary. They are actually there, as MPs are entitled to do, and members of the House of Lords, to, if you like, jump ahead of the queue, because this is their workplace, and actually go and pay their respects. And that link between court and politics uh, is very, very central to the history of this building. As a court of justice, it was also the place where, in 1606, Guy Fawkes was condemned to death for plotting to blow up Parliament when King James was there for the state opening. And again, 43 years later, extraordinary to think it's such a short period of time in the span of the history of this country, Charles I was tried and condemned to death inside that hall where the woman who wore the crown of state, who was his modern-day successor for 70 years, now lies in state. Uh, the history of this country in so many ways is contained in that one building, the, the battles between people and politics, between crown and the ordinary folk of this nation. And a reminder that the BBC is offering a continuous 24-hour view of the Queen's lying in state for those who would like to pay their respects but can't be in London or are unable to queue. The service is available on the BBC homepage, the BBC News website and the app, the iPlayer, on BBC Parliament and the red button. I know it's all very complicated but you will find there are lots of signposts to it uh, in whatever technology you use, whether you're sitting at home with a a telly or uh, you're actually using a phone or some other device to watch us and be with us here and it's very good to have you with us here because it's a very uh, thoughtful reflective time for people in this country regardless of their views of monarchy and it, it's comforting to know that people in the UK and around the world have us in their thoughts too. That's it from Westminster for now. I'll hand you back to the studio. Sean, many thanks, and we'll have more from Sean in Westminster later in the afternoon. A Ukrainian government advisor says around 1,000 dead bodies have been found in the recently liberated city of Izium, which had been under Russian occupation for months. The number of dead in Izium hasn't been officially announced or independently verified. The city has been heavily damaged by shelling. From Kiev, Hugo Beshega sent this report. This is what the Russians left behind in Izium a key city now back in Ukrainian hands. Almost nothing remains untouched by the war. These are the visible scars. What lies beneath, it's still not clear. Bodies are being found and allegations of torture are emerging. The horrors of life under occupation. We were staying in the basements without food and water. 
Russia was providing humanitarian help, and initially I refused to take it. To be honest, I didn't want to take anything from Russia, but we had nothing to eat. We had to survive. Ukraine is pressing ahead. It says all invaded territory will be taken back. He knows it won't be easy, but it feels it's got the momentum. Here, a show of defiance, a visit by President Zelensky with the front line just miles away. His message was as clear as ever. You see that Russia is destroying, and you see the mass of the stretch again. But the main thing is that we are coming back and we are on the way to the end. But Russia is fighting back. Perhaps it's no coincidence that this time they attacked the president's hometown. A dam was hit and residents had to evacuate. Ukraine's advancing Kharkiv has been stunning. Officials say an area larger than the Count of Devon was recaptured in just a few days. But what happens next? In the south, the situation is said to be more difficult. There, the top prize is the city of Kherson. As many as 20,000 Russian troops are believed to be holding up with limited supplies. After pushing the Russians out of the northeast, the Ukrainians hope to do the same elsewhere. Much will depend on what this man decides to do. President Putin today arrived in Uzbekistan for talks with regional leaders. At the top of the agenda, a meeting with President Xi of China. For the Kremlin, the visit is designed to show that Russia isn't isolated and the Western sanctions haven't worked. But with his army and the economy in trouble, the world is waiting to see his next move. Hugo Mashega, BBC News, Kiev. Sport now, full roundup from the BBC Sports Centre with Laura. Hello. Hi, Martin. Good afternoon, everyone. Roger Federer has announced he is to retire from tennis after next week's Labour Cup in London. The 20 time Grand Slam winner says it's a bittersweet decision, but there is so much to celebrate. He thanked his family and friends. Here's our sports correspondent, Andy Swiss. Where do you begin with Roger Federer? Not just one of the greats of tennis, but one of the greats of world sport. But as he said in his statement, he is now 41 years old. He's not played a competitive match since he was knocked out of the quarterfinals at Wimbledon last summer. And it seems that the knee injury, which has been plaguing him really in recent years, has finally got the better of him. But he is one of the most successful tennis players uh, that the sport has ever seen. He won the men's singles at Wimbledon eight times more than any other man in history. He was really the king of centre court. He first won it back in 2003. That was the first of five Wimbledon titles in a row. He last won it, won it in uh, 2017 amidst hugely emotional scenes. He won 20 Grand Slam titles in total, uh, six Australian Opens, eight Wimbledons, five US Opens, one French Open. Only Rafael Nadal and Novak Djokovic have more Grand Slam titles than that in the men's game. But as I say, he has suffered with injuries over recent years. He was world number one member for the best part of six years in his prime. But over the last few seasons, we have seen him struggling more and more with injuries. And he says that next week's Labour Cup, a team event, uh, which is taking place in London, will be his final event in competitive tennis. And as you mentioned, this, of course, comes just after the retirement of Serena Williams. So uh, tennis has seen the retirement of two of its greatest players in history in just a matter of weeks. Well, as you would expect, there's been lots of reaction to Federer's retirement from the world of tennis. Wimbledon said it's been a privilege to witness your journey and see you become a champion in every sense of the word. The great Billie Jean King called Federer a champion's champion with a historic career and memories that will live on and on. And the US Open champion and world number one, Carlos Alcaraz, simply said Roger with a broken heart emoji. Now, with the World Cup just over two months away, England manager Gareth Southgate has named his squad for the final round of games in the Nations League. And amongst the 28-man squad is Brentford's Ivan Tony, who gets his first call-up to the senior side. The striker has scored five goals in six league matches so far this season. Goalkeeper Dean Henderson is also recalled for the upcoming matches against Italy and Germany. Manchester United's Marcus Rashford pick, misses out after picking up an injury. 
Meanwhile, Northern Ireland manager Ian Barraclough has included a new face in his squad. Kofi Balmer gets his first call-up for the matches against Kosovo and Greece later this month. Northern Ireland have gone 14 matches without a win in the competition and have currently just two points from four games. England's one-day captain Joss Butler says he and his teammates want to honour the Queen during their historic tour of Pakistan. The squad arrived in the country earlier today ahead of seven T20 internationals, the first of which gets underway on Tuesday. It's the first time England have toured Pakistan in 17 years. Yorkshire Cricket Club have announced that they've reached a settlement agreement with former coach Andrew Gale and ex-bowling coach Richard Pyra following their sackings last year. The pair were among 16 members of staff sacked in December in the fallout from the Azim Rafiq racism scandal. The compensation package comes after Gale and Pyra won a claim for unfair dismissal in June. Scotland have named their 32-player squad as they prepare for their first Women's Rugby World Cup since 2010. Head coach Brian Eason has included 19-year-old Emma Orr, who only made her debut in the Na Six Nations earlier this year. Rachel Malcolm will captain Scotland, who are in Pool A, alongside New Zealand, Australia and Wales. The tournament gets underway in early October. That's all the sport for now, Martine. Laura, thank you very much. Let's go back to Westminster, where members of the public, of course, are queuing for the Queen's lying in state in the first full day that that's been happening. Let's join my colleague, Sean Lay. Who's there? Sean. Martin, thank you very much. I'm here with uh, Martin and Emma Lloyd, who have come down from Northampton. Is that that's right? That's correct. Yeah, we've come down about 10 o'clock this morning. That's right. When did you make the decision? Um, <laughs> Tuesday? And yeah, we decided, Tuesday. Didn't and we, I... this morning that we would definitely come down. So yeah. we come down to Watford and then got the tube in. That's Brilliant. Right. And how's it been so far? Yeah, not too bad. Not, not too bad. About Better than hours. I thought. About six hours. So not too bad at all, to be yeah. honest. We've, we've been moving most of the time. So it's been a steady, steady walk. You picked one of the better days. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I dread to think what it will be like at the weekend, but we've been very fortunate. I'm, very no I'm noticing your brooch, Emma. Um, it was my mother's, who's no longer with me, and um, my 10-year-old daughter asked me to wear it today because obviously she's at school, so I, that's why I've got so that So you're on. here for her as well? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I just think it builds up a lot of emotion, doesn't it, and things like this. So we had to come. I just felt compelled to come. Yeah, and we've got to go and put a card from Jessica up at Green Park. Yeah. Uh, when we're finished here. So. Oh, there's an there's a opportunity for people to do that as a display yes, part. Yes. Hope so, yeah. yeah. Hope so, yeah. 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 So that's what's next, yes. Um, what is today, what is this whole business of marking the passing of the Queen and having this kind of public uh, mourning mean to you? I think it's, it's, it's only right that we should be here. It's the only monarch that I've ever known since I was born. She's a queen, obviously, and I'm a woman, so that's a great thing to know by. And we'll only have a king going forward, but I just feel like she's everybody's grandmother. It's really special to be here, and I feel very honoured to have the opportunity to come. Uh, Martin, uh, I think Emma may have dropped you in it there, because she said very pointedly, <laughs> she's the only monarch I remember. <laughs> yeah, well, she's the only monarch I know. Because oh, good, that's I all right. I, 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 was, <laughs> I, I was born in January 53, so six months before her coronation, yeah. so she's the only monarch I've known, and, uh, yeah, she's uh, a, very, a very special lady. Well, you've been talking to people as you can. In fact, I wrenched you away from some people you got friendly with in the queue. Um, describe to me what people have been talking about. The weather, no, where they've come from. No. <laughs> the top no. question is, um, where have you come from? How yeah. far have you come from? You know, we've seen people from America, from Canada, Northern Ireland. You know, people have obviously got in the queues very early mm. and very quickly. Um, and I think there's just been quite a nice atmosphere, really. Quite sombre, but still very caring. People are sharing stories and yes. their thoughts and feelings. Yeah, yeah they are. And... Uh, it, it's been, um, I wouldn't say it's been uplifting, but it's, it's been a, a pleasant experience. Yeah, not, you, not disappointed in coming at all. No. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you, you don't yet know what it'll be like inside. No. You're a bit kind of... I mean, I think, yeah, I'll be honest with you, if it was me, I'd be a bit nervous about yeah. what do I do, where do I stand, what do I look Absolutely. at? Absolutely. Yeah, that's right. Um, and you, you feel... I mean, there was a couple last night where I watched on the live feed and I thought, God, they've been there a long time. So you don't want to sort of take up too much time when you're sort of saying your final people. goodbye and that, you, you know, you, you've got to be conscious of other people who are coming up behind you. And is that what you feel you're doing? Yeah. 
yeah, I'm saying goodbye, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll say a little prayer, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I think I just feel a little bit nervous. I think that's the closer we get. I think it's just natural, really, isn't it? I've never met her, so for me, it's it's even more special. And I was only a child when um, the Queen's mother died, and I was too young to come then. So this is, yeah, it's very special. I'm really pleased to be here. Martin. Fortunately, fortunately my wife and I did meet her. Oh, we, right. we Tell met, us about that. When they opened, she came to Northampton to open the new Guildhall, uh, and I was a councillor at that time, and we had the opportunity to have dinner with her and and to uh, uh, meet her afterwards as well and that was that was special as well yeah so you have a very real personal memory yeah. Yeah. and a very real personal reason to come and say thank you yes absolutely yeah yeah martin lloyd emma lloyd thank you both very thank much you. Thank, you. thank you for your patience okay. and i hope we haven't kept Thanks. you too long no from the moment thank you have Bye a good bye. journey back. Thank you. Just a flavour there, Martine. I think every person here is a story. Every life is a story. Those who are sharing them, not just sharing them with people who are here to tell the story and people like me who are kids professionally paid to be nosy, but they're telling them to one another. They're sharing those stories. They're sharing those laughs. They're sharing those memories. And in that sense, I think it is a really comforting experience for the people here in a way that perhaps... For those at home, it's not quite the same. There is a way, obviously, through all the technology you can share it. But I think those who've been here in this queue on these days, in this occasion, for many of them a once-in-a-lifetime experience, will have a lot of memories to share when they get home. Absolutely, Sean. It's very much a communal experience, isn't it? People very much want to be part of this extraordinary uh, opportunity to pay their respects. I find it very moving to listen to those stories. Sean, we'll be back with you in a little while. Thank you very much. Well, let's talk then about what it is to lie in state as we're seeing all of those people queue for hours and hours to pay their respects to Queen Elizabeth II. We can speak to Tracy Borman, historian and author of Crown and Scepter and New History of British Monarchy. And Tracy, it was only a few months ago that we were overlooking Buckingham Palace together enjoying the, the Platinum Jubilee pageant. And here we are on, on a very different sort of day, a very different sort of subject to talk about. What, what goes through your mind when you see these pictures of the lion state? I know it's hard to believe, isn't it? We cast our mind back to that, that June day. And that's what I was writing about. You know, it was all geared for the Platinum Jubilee. And even though, of course, this day too has been expected, it's somehow taken us all by surprise. And I think it is really like watching history unfold before our very eyes. And we're seeing some things well, most of us are seeing this for the first time. You know, it's been 70 years since the death of a monarch and all of the accompanying ceremonial. And then we've seen things for the first time ever, such as uh, Charles III's accession council, which has never been televised. So it really feels like a truly historic moment and one that most of us will never see again. How far does it date back then for a monarch to lie in state in Westminster Hall? Well, that's actually, in the grand scheme of things, given it's a thousand year history of the monarchy, it's relatively recently. It goes back to the Queen's great grandfather, Edward VII, who started the tradition in 1910. And he apparently was inspired by the example of Prime Minister Gladstone, who lay in state there uh, a few years earlier. And every monarch since has lain in state in Westminster Hall, as well as a couple of uh, distinguished people who weren't monarchs, such as Sir Winston Churchill. How long ago then um, did the, the, the idea of lying in state begin? Because, of course, we're seeing phenomenal numbers of people uh, turning yeah. up, travelling from foreign countries to pay their respects. But in the past, it wouldn't have been anything on this scale. It wouldn't. I, I think probably the closest comparison is the Queen Mother back in 2002, um, and then 200,000 people uh, queued uh, to see her coffin in, in Westminster Hall. Uh, but prior to that, it wasn't anything like those numbers. And, and I mean, I should say that for centuries, monarchs have been uh, laying in state um, after death, but not in Westminster Hall and not with the same degree of ceremony and certainly not 
with the the huge snaking queues of people and it speaks volumes about the esteem in which the late Elizabeth II is held. She did her duty unflinchingly for 70 years and people just want to say thank you for that. Yeah, there's some of the stories, Tracy, are so incredibly moving, aren't they? And, and it's about what people felt about the Queen, this connection that they feel that they had with her, even though most of them will never have met her, of course. That's the great irony, isn't it? In, in that it's on the one hand, we're, we're marking the passing of a, a national and international figure, uh, but we do feel a sense, or many people do, of, of personal loss, even though uh, most of us were not fortunate enough uh, to know the Queen. Um, but th there is a sense that uh, that we've lost something uh, more than just our sovereign. It's, it's a deeply personal thing. And you can just see the reactions of the crowds. And particularly yesterday, I was struck with the line in state procession, uh, the atmosphere notably shifted as the procession uh, reached the crowds and all of a sudden there was silence and then there was weeping and then actually that very emotional, spontaneous applause. And it, it's just, I can't take my eyes off it at the moment. Um, I'm, you know, it, it just feels like history in the making. It is fascinating to watch, isn't it, as each person approaches uh, the, the, the coffin in Westminster Hall and you watch the reaction of the person who's right there in front of the catafalque and also those behind, immediately behind as they're anticipating their turn. Yes, and it's something very special. And this goes back centuries, the idea that a monarch is almost divine. They have this sort of mystical aura and so does anything they touch and certainly so does a royal coffin. It has this this strange um, kind of aura effect on people, whether or not you believe in that kind of thing, it, it's just striking. And I think as well, when we saw in the procession yesterday, the, uh, the Imperial State crown on top of the coffin glittering in the sunshine, and, and you could tell people couldn't take their eyes from that or from the coffin, but you're absolutely right. Looking at the reaction of the people who are there in Westminster Hall, they finally reached the front of the queue and well, it, it, it says it all, that it was more than worth the wait. And all of the detail that you must be taking in as a historian, uh, mm. on, on a, a solemn occasion, but a fascinating yeah. one in terms of constitutional history. It's so fascinating, and I'm literally writing about it because I'm having to go back and add a chapter to my book because it's it, it's too significant. It's it's by far uh, the most important landmark uh, in the history of the monarchy in recent times. And when I say recent, I mean in the past couple of centuries. Um, and so I am looking at it with a historian's eye, but also, you know, me personally as well. Just the, the way I react is is not what I was expecting. Uh, it's it's affected me quite deeply as a person, but setting that aside, as a historian, I'm finding it utterly gripping. Oh, it reduces me to tears on a regular basis. I, I'm not ashamed to say. Tracy Borman, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to speak now to um, a Paralympian who won a grand total of 11 gold medals, the life peer, Tanny Gray-Thompson, Baroness Gray-Thompson and Dame Tanny, uh, you met the Queen on three different occasions, I believe, when you were being bestowed with various honours. Yeah, I've been very fortunate. I was awarded an MBE, OBE and DBE, and each time it was presented by the Queen. And, and what strikes me was her ability uh, to ask pertinent questions to about 150 people that were there on that occasion to receive national honours. Uh, and it's an amazing day. It's a day for family, you know, as an athlete. You don't get to share those big moments with your family, but uh, I know it was my mum and dad were very proud to be there and, and be part of it as well. I'm sure they were. Uh, and you've been to pay your respects in Westminster Hall. Tell us what the atmosphere is like in there. It's incredible. I mean, it was really emotional. So the step free access is through the eastern door, and, uh, and sort of two guards open the doors, and then you're right beside where the Queen is is lying in state. But I think. What made it emotional for me was actually just the silence in Westminster Hall. So that's no, normally the public point of entry. It's very loud. There's often school groups there, lots of different people. And it was just quiet. Uh, and you're able to kind of stop and, and look up the steps 
into St. Stephen's and four lines of people coming down um, very calmly, quietly, very gracefully. And then again, as, as we just heard, seeing the emotion on people's faces, I, I cried, actually. I'm not normally uh, that emotional person, but um, there was something about being in Westminster Hall with all those different people uh, that, that was really deeply emotional. There's a massive connection, isn't there? I mean, a, a great leveller. You know, here's a woman who served us and the Commonwealth for 70 years, had an immensely privileged life, but everyone can share that sense of loss because most people will have lost people who've mattered to them. Absolutely. And, you know, in terms of people's reaction, there's a lot of emotion right now. And I think there are people who didn't expect to be affected by it, who, who have been in, in lots of different ways. There was a lot of emotion of people walking through uh, Westminster Hall today, uh, lots of curtsies, bows, people blowing kisses. Um, and then when you come out the other side and you leave carriage gates to get onto Parliament Square, then it was it was much more uplifting. People were chatting, asking, you know, where they'd come from, how long you'd been in the queue. Um, and they kind of wanted to share that experience. So uh, it was all of it was very emotional. It really felt when people had come through the other side that a degree of weight had been lifted from their shoulders because of um, that, that shared moment. Interesting that you talk about accessibility because we've had quite a lot of, of people contacting us saying, you know, how easy is it for me to visit if they perhaps use a wheelchair or their mobility is not so good? Uh, and, and you said it, it was very easy to access. Uh, I'm, I'm also very privileged as a pass holder in the building. I, I didn't have to queue. So uh, I have to say that as well. But um, other disabled people I've known who've been there today, uh, is they go to the Tate, they get a time allocation uh, and, you know, the queues. There, there is some queue in there, um, but actually it's completely step free and things like toilets uh, are there as well. So I think that's kind of important to, to know that. But, um, yeah, it's I, I've never been in any environment like uh, I've, I've been today, you know, c competing in lots of different championships and different events. There was um, a solemnity. It, it, it was incredible privilege to be there. And as, as parliamentarians, we should be um, very proud and, and feel very lucky that we're able to, to go and see the Queen line in state in the way that we were. Yeah, because this is a place that you know pretty well. It's your, one, you know, a place that you work. Yeah, technically, I can call it my house, uh, which uh, is one of the sort of the, the strange foibles of parliamentary language. But it's Westminster Hall is a place that we're in and out of every day. It has incredible history. You know, part of that building goes back to 1079. That's why we're called the Mother of Parliaments. Um, you know, not just the people who've lied in the lane in state there. You know, Charles the uh, First was was tried there. Um, you know, just off Westminster Hall uh, is, you know, where his death warrant was signed. So so there's tremendous history in the place. And, and you don't always feel that every day when you go in. You do feel a weight because of, you know, that this, this building is where things happen and things matter. But today it, it felt um, a, a totally different feeling. It, to be honest, it's hard to explain how, how different it felt, but it was it was incredible to be there. I know Westminster Hall and it is a very big bustly place and it echoes a lot. So the idea of experiencing it with these people, this number of people in it, but that peace that you describe. And what I love is that people have felt able to turn up however they wish. Some have dressed very smartly, some have come in jeans and a T-shirt and it just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. Um, I think there's a sort of uh, a, a Britishness about it. So there were kind of lots of people sort of wrapped in Union Jacks. I've seen a few Union Jack suits. Um, it, it's actually, you know, we have a dress code when we work in the building. Um, that dress code doesn't matter today. It, it's about uh, paying your respects and, and being part of something that is truly historic. I mean, it's an extraordinary building to visit any time. Yeah. But under these circumstances, for, you, for your first experience of the Houses of Parliament to be seeing this, must be really quite overwhelming in some ways. And I think people forget it's a public building, you know, that you can go in. You don't have to have an invite. You can go in into central lobby and uh, fill in a, a green form and, and ask to see your MP. Now, the chances of you actually being able to see an MP if you just pop in for the day is is relatively slim because of the business schedule. Um, but it is a public building and there are tours and 
I think that's, you know, for many people, when you hear say that, you know, a lot of people have not met the Queen, a lot of people don't realise it is a public building and this is a chance to to open up the building. It is a stunning place to work. Um, you know, the heating also doesn't always work terribly well uh, and there's mice everywhere and, you know, you wouldn't create something in, in that way again. But um, certainly I and a lot of my colleagues and lords, you know, feel that weight of responsibility because of the history in the building. Every single day when you, you go in, you know, you, you're trying to make people's lives better. Um, and, and that is a sense of responsibility. But um, it's, I was going to say, I hope people, you know, welcome the experience. Again, it's it's quite hard to find the right words, but but actually, you know, remembering that this is a public building and people have a right to come in, I think is incredibly important for, for British democracy. It's quite amusing in some ways because the Queen, although she was the Queen, often used to say she didn't like a lot of fuss. It's, uh, I, wonder, I wonder what she'd make of this. Yeah, and, you know, traditionally, uh, she wouldn't be uh, going, you know, into Westminster Hall when she comes in for state opening. Her line of route is, is, is you know, very tight, actually. Um, you know, she can only walk on blue carpet So uh, when, when she, she came in. So uh, there is something kind of really interesting that she's in a part of the building that she wouldn't uh, have, have normally been in. Um, I think, you know, it's interesting. We're, it's still quite hard. To, I get a bit confused sometimes between, you know, talking about her in present tense and past tense. It's going to be a, a period of adjustment for everybody. Yes, it certainly is. And a lot of people keep saying Prince Charles and then correcting themselves to say King Charles. Just finally, and tell me to mind my own business if, if you want to, um, what, was, what was, go was going through your mind when you stood and looked at the coffin? I think it was actually just the solemnity of the guards and um, the peacefulness. And, you know, everyone's got a different relationship with the monarch and it's a, a period of, of mourning and quiet. Uh, but actually, it was sense of peace. Actually, that was the biggest thing. Well, I, I won't be joining the queue, I'm sure, because I've got plenty of work to be doing here, but it is um, mesmerising to watch, the, watch that queue as, as people from all walks of life uh, pass by and to pay their respects. Um, Baroness Gray Thompson, Tanya Gray Thompson, thank you so much for talking to us and, and sharing your experience with us. Thank you very much. Well, as the nation and people across the world mourn the loss of Queen Elizabeth II, the BBC has set up a web page where viewers and listeners can share their memories and pay tribute. You can send your tribute in words, still pictures or video by email to yourqueen at bbc.co.uk. We can contact us via WhatsApp on plus four four seven seven five six one six five eight zero three. The details are there at the bottom of your screen, and you can also find them on our website, which also has a contact form. Time for a look at the weather forecast, and uh, Helen is here. And many people in that queue will be very grateful of dry weather, Helen. And I think, Martine, it will be primarily dry over the next two or three days. There is just a slight chance of a shower tomorrow. I think the main thing will be how chilly it feels if you're queuing early in the morning or into the evening hours because we've changed our wind direction. Our wind is now coming down from the north and with it, it's bringing some Arctic air. So it's gonna be the first significant chilly blast of the autumn. We've just about reached 20 degrees today in St. James's Park, but I think that'll be the last time for some time. And that has been back to June. Now you saw on the satellite and radar picture, there are quite a number of showers across Scotland, quite heavy showers. And those showers will continue to push southwards on that brisk wind as we go through this evening and overnight. But inland, where the shelter from that wind, temperatures will fall lower tonight single figures for parts of England and Wales. We haven't seen temperatures this low for some time and a touch of grass frost across Scotland, across the glens. But this is the forecast you can see for London. For the next four or five days, it is primarily dry. There's slightly increased risk of a shower, as I say, tomorrow and possibly into Monday. But on balance, I think most places it will stay dry. In fact, there will be a few more showers for the rest of eastern England through tomorrow. And on that bracing wind, probably
possibly peaking tomorrow in the east, gusting 45 miles an hour, starting to ease a little bit further west during the day and therefore the shower activity will start to ease as well because we've got a ridge of high pressure building in which is the ridge of high pressure which will give us that more settled weather. So as we go through tomorrow we're looking rather than this evening at 12 to 18 degrees Celsius which actually is a notch down on today. As I say today could be the last day that we see 20 degrees somewhere and that has been the case since the 1st of June. The weekend does bring high pressure with it but we do have a weather front with us later on Saturday into Sunday but Saturday morning looks like the chilliest morning. Look at temperatures in rural parts of southern England could get to freezing in a few spots so quite widely some grass frost at least and a bright sunny start but through the day cloud will increase across Scotland to bring some rain here particularly to the north and gradually the cloud will then meander its way southwards through Saturday night and into Sunday but still pleasantly warm feeling pleasantly warm in that strong September sunshine further south bit more cloud as you can see on Sunday drifting southwards there's the chance of a shower on this very weak weather front by that stage later Sunday and into Monday but again similar temperatures we are just heading in as I say to a chillier spell than we've had for some time but it is set largely dry. Welcome to BBC News. Our headlines this hour. Tens of thousands of people queue to pay their respects to Queen Elizabeth as she lies in state in Westminster Hall. The queue outside is now several miles long and people from all around the country have travelled to join it and say a final farewell. And I'm Chi Chi Zindu, who joined the queue earlier this afternoon. It's taken us about four hours to get to this point, just next to Westminster Bridge. And we've still got a little way to go. At the other end of the world, in another of those countries that is part of the family that looked to the Queen for so long, Maori leaders in New Zealand have been paying tribute to Her Majesty the Queen. We look back at the historic apology she signed for the killings they experienced under her ancestors. I'm Martine Croxall in the BBC studio in other news. In Ukraine, amid the devastation of conflict, more claims of atrocities committed by Russian troops. What will happen to energy bills next month? We take a look at what the changes might mean for all of us. A splash of pink at the funeral of nine-year-old Olivia Pratt Corbell, killed by a gunman in Liverpool last month. Hello and welcome to Westminster, the heart of civic, public and institutional life in the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland and the last opportunity for members of the public over the coming days to say their goodbyes and pay their respects to the country's longest serving monarch as Queen Elizabeth lies in state. It's the first full day that she has lain in state in central London after the body was brought from Edinburgh uh, with all the ceremonial in the company of members of her family. 
We're not seeing them during the course of this day. This is a day very much for members of the public, the queuing of people who have uh, given up the last several hours of their day to queue uh, along the bridges, along both sides of the River Thames, to follow what, it's that curious shot you just saw there from above, which shows the chicane that's been provided, a zigzag section, when people come almost close, where they can almost see the Palace of Westminster and, and feel like they're, they're at the last leg, and then there is the chicane to try and slow down the num uh, and process the numbers so that there is no congestion. The thing they want to avoid most of all, congestion at the very front of the queue, just where people reach the sort of airport-style security. The purpose of this, really, is to ma manage in a dignified manner the opportunity for members of the public to pay their respects and to maximise the amount of time that's available for people to do that. They have, from yesterday, throughout day and night for the coming four days, through the weekend, until Monday at 6.30 a.m., when the last member of the public will be ushered from the Great Hall of Westminster and the funeral day itself will begin. We know more about the arrangements for Monday's funeral. Royal officials confirmed today, Thursday, the details of the arrangements for the funeral of Queen Elizabeth. The service itself will be held at Westminster Abbey in central London, again, one of the oldest buildings in the UK. And the Queen is then to be taken, after the service is completed, uh, by carriage, through the streets of central London, through the streets of West London, out through the suburbs, and then beyond towards Berkshire, to the Royal Borough of Windsor, and to Windsor Castle, a place that she called home, as well as a working palace, in the heart of a busy market town in England. Uh, she will then be interred with the Duke of Edinburgh, her late husband, in St George's Chapel, in a private service which will take place at 7.30 in the evening on Monday. Well, King Charles and his sister and brothers will hold a vigil uh, at uh, Westminster Hall at 6.30 on Friday evening. The opportunity then again for us to see them as part of the tribute. Uh, the King is reportedly spending today not just resting but also talking to foreign dignitaries and continuing some of the business that's been set aside for the last week uh, it, since Her Majesty died in Balmoral last Thursday. Now here at Westminster Hall, which is just the other side of the Palace of Westminster, uh, we're looking on the eastern side of the palace, so over on the western end of the building. It's actually the oldest part of the building. It's behind the canopy here. As you look at that shot, down to the bottom left would be where the entrance to Westminster Hall is to be found. If you've ever walked past uh, the Parliament buildings in London, you will have seen it opposite Westminster uh, Underground Station as you cross the road. It's the building on the very corner facing onto the river, and it is the oldest building uh, really in the palaces of Westminster. There is a secret about Westminster. It's not very old. Uh, the palace was rebuilt after a devastating fire back in the early 19th century. Uh, and it was mostly replaced. The one part of the building that survived is Westminster Hall, and hence it's an imposing edifice. Uh, it was erected in the 1097, so almost a thousand years ago, on the orders of William II, the son of the Conqueror. It was a banqueting hall. Then it became uh, the place of justice uh, in England, and it served as a place for courts to meet right up until the 1880s, and it was only after uh, 1882, I think I'm right in saying, uh, that the opportunity came for it to be used for uh, commemorations of this kind. The first to receive that honour was a Victorian Prime Minister, William Gladstone, who uh, lay in state there uh, for several nights uh, with people having the opportunity to pay their respects, his colleagues and so on. But as a public mourning opportunity, we're really talking about the last hundred years as monarchs, one after the other, have died and they've been succeeded. Uh, they, their remains have laid in state inside. So the hall is now open to the public day and night, as I say, until early Monday morning. If we look inside, we can see the sort of scene that is greeting people after they have queued for hours uh, to pay their respects. And it is being guarded, the coffin at the heart of uh, these commemorations is guarded day and night by bodyguards. We'll see in just a few moments uh, the, 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 the shots that show you 
the configuration. So as people approach, many of those people you're seeing now will be political figures, members of parliament and members of the House of Lords who have the opportunity, along with members of the public, it's obviously their working environment, to join the queue as well, to come in and then uh, the, those are the politicians, public figures on the left there, joining other members of the public uh, to come and queue and have a moment, and it is only a moment, but a moment for a personal reflection, a personal prayer, perhaps a personal moment of thanks or to say goodbye or maybe even to criticise. Who knows what goes through the minds of those people who have come to pay their respects uh, to the Queen's Coffin, which is right on the top there uh, of the catafalque, the, the frame that supplies the, the support, which is in red, and the buyer, which is in purple, uh, which is effectively uh, the stand is the buyer and the catafalque is the, the raised structure, really, on which the coffin is displayed. And that obviously gives people the maximum opportunity to see uh, the coffin draped in the royal standard. And as I say, the guards there is provided 24 hours a day, seven days a week, a guard by members of the Sovereign's Bodyguard, the Household Division or Yeoman Warders of the Tower of London also in uh, standing there. And as I say, we expect uh, the King, uh, Princess Anne and uh, Edward and Andrew to also do their time standing vigil over their mother's coffin. Our correspondent Caroline Hawley has more. It's a week since the country learned of Queen Elizabeth's death, a week of national public mourning and of private grief. And right now, thousands upon thousands of people wait patiently to pay their last respects. They've been on their feet all night and there are hours left to go before they'll get to Westminster Hall. The queue, several miles long, snakes along the banks of the River Thames. Wristband, please. Thank you. Wristband. It's been orderly, organised and, by all accounts, a friendly experience. A coming together of people who want to show their gratitude and respect. Look at all these people, you know, it's... Um, they're coming for their Queen. There's even tourists here. We've met so many nice people, so it's, it's been lovely. And I would regret if I didn't come. Absolutely regret. Today is the first full day of the Queen lying in state before her funeral on Monday. Last night, Emily and her two sons arrived in London from Birmingham. Can you remember where the end of the queue is, Freddie? It's London Bridge. London Bridge. Let's go and catch the queue. Yes! Joining people from all corners of the country and all ages. No bedtime, no school today. For them, being here was much too important to miss. We've just come out of seeing Her Majesty. It was absolutely amazing. Awesome. Awesome. Thoroughly worth the six hour wait that we had. In the middle of last night, out of public view, the military was busy rehearsing for its role in this historic moment. Preparations for the Queen's death have been years, decades in the making, meticulous plans now being meticulously practised and finessed. 142 sailors from the Royal Navy will draw the state gun carriage used for Queen Victoria's funeral that will take the Queen's coffin to Westminster Abbey on Monday. All bearers even practised their final duty to their former commander-in-chief, carrying an empty black coffin. At 10.44, the Queen's coffin will be taken from Westminster Hall to Westminster Abbey, a solemn journey that will take eight minutes. It was here that she was crowned back in 1953. The funeral service, attended by heads of state from every corner of the globe, starts at 11am. It will be followed by a national two-minute silence. The route of the procession goes past Buckingham Palace and on to Wellington Arch, where her coffin will be transferred into the state hearse. The late monarch will then be driven by road to Windsor Castle for a more intimate service at St George's Chapel, attended by members of the royal family and staff who served her throughout her reign. She will then be laid to rest in the evening in a private service. At Sandringham in Norfolk today, the Prince and Princess of Wales came to greet well-wishers and to look at the many, many floral tributes to the Queen. Inside Westminster Hall, for these members of the public, the long wait to say goodbye was over. Everyone here with their own feelings, memories, emotions. As the country prepares with pomp and pageantry to bid its final farewell to Britain's longest ever reigning monarch. Caroline Hawley, BBC News.
Now, the story of today and yesterday and tomorrow and through the weekend until we reach the funeral on Monday will be the stories of the people who have come to pay their respects, the people who are queuing behind me. Some have waited, what, four, five, six hours to get to that point. And the queue stretches not just this side of the River Thames, but as you may be aware from some of the coverage we've already broadcast, it goes the south side of the Thames too. So this is uh, over, I think, on Westminster side. So this is not very far from where I'm standing now. We can't really see from here, but what I can tell you is that people are moving kind of sideways because there's a sort of chicane arrangement, uh, which means that they have to... Uh, instead, if they were walking a straight line, you'll know if you've ever been in an airport queue, uh, the, the straight line would be the quickest point, but it's not necessarily the best point from the airport security point of view in terms of keeping the cr crowds under control, ensuring there are no bottlenecks. And, of course, bottlenecks are a security risk. And let's be honest about that. And that is the reason why they have these kind of measures, to ensure there's no point where suddenly everybody's bunched together and that creates potential risk. So that's the idea of it. It also means, unfortunately, it takes it that much longer for people to get through. But better that people are slow down there than that you end up with people bunching into the entrance of Westminster Hall and it all becomes a bit unseemly and a bit undignified. And the stewards and the police, it's a very low-key police presence, actually, considering where we are. Uh, the, the tone, the mood is very positive. Everybody's being very cooperative. There are toilets and water fountains provided. This plan has existed for many years as the Queen uh, got older and as people began to think more and more of the moment and the ceremonial that would be required to mark the moment of her passing, uh, these arrangements were put in place and they've been constantly refined by those who understand the need for these arrangements for the importance, not just for the people who are here, but for people watching around the world, that this moment is a dignified moment because it is a moment that marks the departure of a woman who has been a public global figure for 70 years, in fact longer. One of the things that I always mem remember is going to Anne Frank's house in uh, Amsterdam and seeing that in the bedroom where she was holed up for so many years before she was found by the Nazis and she and her family dragged off to the concentration camps where she met her death, is that there's a little photograph on the wall cut out of a newspaper, glued to the wall, and that photograph was of the then Princess Elizabeth. Our correspondent John Maguire has been talking to those who've come not just from this country, from around the world, to pay their own personal respects. From across the United Kingdom and around the globe, they came and they waited and they queued. All for this, a fleeting but significant moment, a chance to say goodbye not just to a monarch, but to a woman who meant so much to so many. Catherine had flown in from the United States just to be here today. Very emotional um, and very poignant, very touching um, to see everyone go in and pay their respects. And you can just feel the love that everyone has for her. Other journeys weren't as far, but no less important. She had compassion, empathy, forgiveness and love. And I think that has given more to the world than anything. If only other leaders could be that way, wouldn't we live in a wonderful place? It was amazing. I wouldn't have missed it. It was worth waiting 11 hours. It really was. I thought to myself, I'll never see her again. So this was the opportunity that I wanted to go and pay my respects. Maureen and her daughter Emmeline made the decision to come this morning and entered via the accessible queue. She got you through your life, didn't she, yeah. Mum? Yeah, so we're here on behalf of our whole family, aren't yes. we? Past and present. <laughs> Along the two-mile queue that straddles both sides of the River Thames, there are volunteers on hand to help. Multi-faith teams are here to offer support and solace. This morning, the Archbishop of Canterbury joined them after playing a leading role in recent days. And the idea of coming to see people here today Let's see how people are, where they've come from. Most people are in very good shape. I had a couple of conversations yesterday where the process had renewed their sense of grief over their own losses. Yes, I've heard that a lot. Yes. And and you know that and particularly coming out, chaplains have found that. 
Leading politicians will have been in Westminster Hall many times, but never before, to pay their respects to their monarch. By day and by night, they will continue to come over the next few days, compelled by their own reasons, with their own stories, but with one thing in common, their desire to say thank you and to say goodbye. John Maguire, BBC News, Westminster. Well, let's hear from some of the people in the queue now. My colleague, uh, Chichi Uzunda, is a lot further away from here. Chichi. Hi, Sean. Yes, we're just, we're not actually that far. We're just next to Westminster. But as you can see, the queue is moving at a much slower pace than it has been all day. We started off in South London, in Bermondsey, and it took us about four hours to get to this point. And we're joined by Theresa. Theresa, you really love the royal family. I do. I love the Queen. I have great respect for, for the Queen and the royal family and I wouldn't miss this for the world. I just came back from Ireland yesterday morning at 8 o'clock flight and I was in London all day yesterday and here all day today. So I'm very pleased and blessed to be here. And how have you found the walk so far? Great, good. It's, I mean, it's been you know slow and then it's been a little bit fast and a few stops in between. I had a few little sit downs and a little sip, a drink. So, yeah, very happy. Your family are based in England. Yes. But you have another connection with them and the royal family. Yeah, my daughter, one of my daughters, I have three daughters living here in Buckinghamshire, one in Windsor, bought a house last year in Windsor with her husband and two children. So I visit there regular. Every couple of months we come over. And you said that you also attended Princess Diana's. Yes, I was at Diana's too, so. That was very sad and I cried all day, left flowers and it was wonderful to be there, so and sad occasion. And have you thought about how you're going to feel when you actually get into the hall? Yeah, I'll be emotional because I did sh shed a tear, a few tears for the Queen and, you know, I will, I will be emotional. So what does the Queen actually mean to you? Well, she's an inspiration, she was an inspiration to the world, you know, and um, we, we were very blessed to have her and she never put a step out of the way in any way, you know, so. And I understand that you have quite the collection of royal memorabilia. I have, I've collected Lady Diana's stuff since day one. And I have everything belonging to her. I've got, my attic is full of stuff. There, I've got a library in my house and that's full of her books and I've got books on the Queen too. So what kind of things do you like to collect? Yeah, I've collected medals and, um, um, like, the cards and stamps and I've got um, paperweights, everything. And how I does your family feel about that? They don't mind, they don't mind, they know what I'm like, you know, I'm not a hoarder as such but I do like that kind of stuff, I'm emotional when it comes to um, things like that, you know. So yeah. one of the things that people have quite enjoyed with this long walk is the people that they're meeting and the new friends that they're creating. How, have you found Yeah, them? I've met some wonderful friends and we've exchanged numbers and I've invited them over to Ireland. We live beside the sea. So, you know, I'm sure some of them will come back, yeah. So we will keep in touch. So, Teresa, we're going to maybe have a light jog to try and catch up where we All left right. off. Yes, <laughs> Fingers no problem, crossed we yes. can. But as you can see, this seems to be a slowing down point of the queue. It has been moving quite a lot and we're hoping that it's not going to take the 12 hours that has been suggested by a number of stewards. We're hoping it will take us about seven hours before we'll actually get to Westminster Hall. Thank you very much. Let's go to Westminster Hall and my colleague Leila Nathu. Leila, uh, what's the, the mood at your end? Well, it's incredibly busy here at Carriage Gates. This is where people come out of the Houses of Parliament. It's a very short walk between the exit of Westminster Hall and then coming out straight onto the street. And it's quite an arresting change of mood because inside Westminster Hall, it's a very sobering experience, near silent. You're struck by the scale of the room, the silence, the reverence, the height of the Queen's coffin, the sparkle of her crown. It's an incredibly moving experience for most people who come through. 
and then they emerge through those gates out into this busy streets reflecting on what they have just seen now three people who have just come from inside Westminster Hall join us now Alan, Edith and Julie, thank you very much for being with us. Just tell us why it was so important for you to come here today. I had to come and pay my respects. It was an absolute must. You know, whatever, whatever happened, whatever the rain or the sunshine, we had to be here just to pay our last respects. I mean, she was such a wonderful lady, uh, a guiding light to so many, that uh, we, you know, we, we just had to be here. So, um, yeah, and... As walking into the building itself, you know, it became very emotional, and uh, it just uh, just makes you so tearful and so saddened. That it's such a such a great loss. What was Not it? Not only for the country, but for the whole of the world. What was it inside that struck you in particular about the procession past the coffin? It was the ambiance. It was the the quietness. You you could hear a pin drop. Everybody was concentrated uh, on what they had to do. Um, to file past, pay their respects. It was done um, in an extremely um, n- nice manner. Edith, was it what you expected going into Westminster Hall today? Well, we watched the television right from the very beginning um, because we are sort of semi-retired. And when I was in there and I knew that I was going to have to move on, I didn't really want to leave her behind. Um, it, that was a hard part, the fact that we weren't going to see her anymore. Um, photographs are one thing, but you did see her. I mean, I was 10 when I first saw her um, in my hometown, and um, we followed her life. We've been to many of the royal residences, including Balmoral, and... Um, it's quite hard, but um, I'm quite sure that King Charles will um, understand how we're all feeling and um, as we know how he must be feeling at the moment. And Julie, you met Alan and Edith in the queue today. They've come from West Sussex, you've come from South London. Why, why did you make the journey on your own today? Because it felt like a magnet pulling me. Um, I've been to the centre of London dozens and dozens of times, never on my own. Um, Anybody that knows me knows I am absolutely terrible with directions. Um, My husband was a bit concerned because I am so terrible with directions. And I said, I'm sure I'll find somebody really, really nice. Um, So when I got to Waterloo, um, I spotted Alan and Edith and I approached them and I said... You know, I've never been to London before on my own. Do you mind if, if I tag along? I'm very kindly. Um, they agreed, and, and um, they've been wonderful company today. I couldn't have asked for better company. How did you find it in there? <laughs> lots of conversation, lots of yeah. discussions and yeah. talking. Yeah. And, yeah. It's been part of the experience as well, making friends. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Met very some, important. Yeah. Met some lovely people Met to some lovely to. people. Yeah. And how was it, Julie, when you finally did get inside Westminster Hall? Surreal. Surreal, deep respect, heartfelt appreciation. Surreal. I noticed that the orb and the, if I'm right, the orb and the, and the sword was on, with on the coffin as well, which I hadn't seen that since, really since the coronation. Um, so, yes, it, it was, you know, you things that that come back to your mind from when you were a child and you see that we're going to see it all again in the not too distant future, you know. And uh, it, it's very, very special for our country to have. Very special. Alan, Edith, Julie, thank you so much for joining us. You can can hear there just a a snapshot of of the people joining us. But, you know, lots of commonalities with others here, making friends in the queue, that welcoming atmosphere, sharing a profound moment for many together in Westminster Hall, filing past the coffin together. And you can see a lot to take in, a lot to process, lots of feelings ignited by that journey past the Queen's coffin, a personal moment for everybody coming here.
Yes, indeed. Leila Nathu at Carriage Gate. Thank you very much. Fascinating uh, to hear from Leila's guests about uh, what this moment meant for them. Uh, let's talk now to a, a man who has very personal memories of the Queen. He is himself a former head of state. Ian Karma was president of Botswana for a decade and his late father, Seretse Karma, very famous man in the history of the independence movement in Africa as the founder and first president of Botswana. President Karma, thank you very much for joining us uh, to talk to BBC News about your recollections and your feelings at this moment. Can I ask you, first of all, what your memories are of the Queen? Well, I first met Her Majesty when she paid a state visit uh, to Botswana. Um, that was when my, my father uh, was president. Um, thereafter that, I met her a couple of times before I became president when there were occasions like celebration of VE Day, um, which were held in London. And then in 2008, I think it was, towards the end of 2008, I was invited for an official visit uh, by the government um, to the UK. And that's where I met the Queen in person at Buckingham Palace. So one head of state to another. Um, but I understand that there was a, a moment where protocol, which the British like to think they're very good at, uh, rather slipped up at, over your title. Well, actually, it was to do with the, the country, the country's name. Because what had happened was that in that year, 2008, there'd been elections in Zimbabwe. And I had taken a very strong stand against uh, the late President Mugabe about the, the rigging and the brutality that took place um, over those elections. So when, when I arrived at Buckingham Palace, I was seated in a holding room with a few other people. And the issue of Zimbabwe was raised. Somebody asked me questions about it. Now, the officer who was to take me in to meet the Queen and announce me was standing by the door listening to the conversation. And the conversation, as I said, was a lot to do with Zimbabwe. And as we got to the door, as I was ushered in and stood there as he announced who I was, he introduced me as the president of Zimbabwe. And um, I was taken aback. I looked at him to see whether, you know, was this some kind of a joke or what? And then I looked at Her Majesty, and she was totally unruffled by it. I was the one who actually was taken aback. And as I went forward to go and greet and meet her, she said, no, don't worry about him. He's new. Um, that's why he made that mistake. So she, she put you at ease uh, entirely during the entire conversation. One obviously had some apprehension meeting Her Majesty, but she was somebody who was able to make you feel like you had known her for a long time. And the conversation uh, proceeded along that manner. You have a very close connection with this country. Uh, your late mother, Ruth, was British. And I think I'm right in saying, Mr President, you were born in Britain. I wonder what kind of you inherited from your mum's side of the family in terms of your view of the monarchy. Well, I think uh, you're right. Yes, I was born in the, in, in the UK. And um, I, it's true to say that my, 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 my mother and her mother, my grandmother, were very devoted uh, royalists. And um, particularly, I remember even my great aunt um, on my mother's side. Um, she was someone who had a lot of uh, memorabilia of, of, of the royal family uh, in the room because she stayed with us for some time before she died, because she was quite old and was living on her own in the UK. And my mother invited her out to come and stay with us. And um, actually, I was happy because the time when the Queen visited us, she was still alive. And the lead up to the Queen's visit, her knowing the Queen was coming to visit, the, the, her comments and her adoration for the Queen is very similar to the people that you've been interviewing in those long lines are waiting to pay their respects as Her Majesty lies in state. Let me ask you about the future, if I may, Mr President. And uh, since Botswana gained its independence, uh, it's been a, a very active member of the Commonwealth. You mentioned already the stand you took over uh, President Mugabe, late President Mugabe, 
of Zimbabwe. You know many of those sometimes quite fraught conversations that must have happened as Commonwealth leaders met. Less so obviously in recent years, but perhaps certainly in the beginning of your time in office, the Queen was still an active presence on the Commonwealth stage. Um, how important was she as part of that, given that she obviously had no direct political power, but as a presence and influence of voice in the Commonwealth's central affairs and in its deliberations? Well, of course, Her Majesty, as head of the Commonwealth, when we went to those Commonwealth meetings, the, the focal point or the, the height of the uh, occasion, despite the various talks that would be held by heads of state and heads of government, was that opportunity when Her Majesty would be there and preside on occasion at some of the events. So that was always the highlight of, 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 the, of, the, of, the, of the Commonwealth meetings, um, the common heads of government meetings. And that was something which I think everybody cherished and looked forward to. And it's something which I would say her presence, her association was like the bond, the cement that kept the Commonwealth together and made it what it is today. That... Uh poses another question, which is the one of the future. There must be many people in, uh, in Africa, much younger than you, or, or, or indeed me, who wonder what this institution is for and don't necessarily feel a terribly direct connection to the UK, maybe even feel antipathy towards the UK because of the history of empire and the history of colonialism. How do you think the Commonwealth can make that transition from a, 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 a relatively respected and admired figure like the Queen, whose continuity, if nothing else, provides that sense of loss for many who may not be monarchists, to a new king and to a different sort of future for the Commonwealth? I think the one thing which um, you do extremely well in the, in the UK is precisely the word you use, continuity. I mean, when, when, when you look at what's happening around uh, the death of Her Majesty, um, the traditions, the ceremonies, the attire, the uniforms, is second to none. It is something which goes back many, many years. And after the Queen died, um, certainly in my case, there was like a kind of em emptiness. But within 24 hours, um, it was being filled by the new king, not particularly because of all the procedures that surround it, but by his own manner and character, um, where literally he wasn't given time to mourn the passing of his dear mother, and he was propelled into this process of being the new sovereign, um, attending ceremonies, having meetings with uh, diplomats and, and politicians, the speeches he had to give, the vigils he was carrying out with his family, the parades, going around meeting and talking to people. Um, he took on this role like you put your hand inside the glove. It was so smooth and with a lot of ease. And within one week, because it's been a week now since um, his dear mother passed, um, uh, King Charles has literally, I would say, earned in one week more respect than many leaders around the world. And you can see it from the people. When you talk about continuity, when you've been interviewing people from every corner of the globe, um, including from Africa, and I've heard some of them refer to her as their grandmother. That is the kind of thing which I think will, will, will is something that only the British can do well. There's, 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 there's um, many countries which have their own ceremonies and their traditions, but um, Britain is second to none when it comes to this. So I'm very sure, as people were shouting out, uh, you know, God save the king, long live the king, um, that this transition is going to be a smooth one and King Charles will continue, um, certainly by the example that his dear mother set. President Karma, Ian Karma, thank you very much for sharing your memories 
and your thoughts and your hopes for the future with us here on BBC News. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. That was the former president of Botswana in Kama talking to us live from Johannesburg in South Africa. Older viewers will recall the name, not of Botswana, but of Bechuana land, which is what the country was known in, as in colonial times, a really important country uh, in uh, southern Africa and now a very vibrant member of the Commonwealth of Nations. And that, that family name. A karma, of course, one that the Queen will have known so well through his late father and his mother Ruth, who was, uh, as Ian Karma was saying, herself British and retained very strong links to the country of her birth. Now, uh, let's talk a bit about the arrangements here because one organisation for which people who are queuing have a lot to be thankful is the Salvation Army. Major Mark Rose is from the Sally Army and until Sunday they have, off have had offices and volunteers serving and helping not just members of the public, also providing an, an additional support service for the police and the others who are organising the events. Tell us, tell us about what you've been doing. Yes, yeah, so we have two vehicles, one based at uh, the end of Waterloo Bridge and, and one on Horse Guards Parade. And we are supporting anyone really who, who needs a cup of tea and a biscuit and a, uh, a, a chance to have a rest and sit down. Um, yes, volunteers, uh, police, uh, lots of security services, uh, some of the military personnel have been coming to us as well, uh, and a lot of the general public, uh, some who've been in the queue, some who are waiting to go into the queue. Um, it's, it's difficult, isn't it, because people come and they, they sort of know that they're going to have to have a long wait, but sometimes we all overestimate our capacity to sustain ourselves at a time like this. Are you getting many cases of people just a bit overcome by it or maybe getting a bit faint or just needing the opportunity to have a warm drink and a sit down and maybe just gather their, gather themselves for the next stage of it. Yeah, um, I don't think we've seen a huge number of people in difficulty, um, but lots of people who just think, OK, it's time to have a sit down, let's, let's have a cup of tea, let's have a chat. It's amazing how many people uh, want to have a chat with you while they drink their tea. Um, so it's, it's been quite special, really. Some of our volunteers have given us some really good stories about you know, the conversations that they've had. So. What sort of things? Oh, everything from uh, stories of their life story, stories of their own grief. Um, seriously, some, some people really struggling with mental health. Um, having a really difficult time and, and the, the cup of tea opens up and some, some really interesting conversations. That, that's something, of course, the Salvation Army volunteers are so used to doing, isn't it? Yeah. They're so uh, adapted to having those conversations, to letting people open up in their own time yeah. and their own way. Yeah. And, and it, it's a special privilege for us, really, to be involved in that. And, uh, you know, often we're just giving out a cup of tea, but, but it always leads to other places uh, and we, we just greatly appreciate that, that we have the privilege of doing it. Um, we're humbled as well. Yeah, what, what sort of advice would you give people who are, are thinking of coming over the, the next few days in, in terms of being ready and prepared for, for coming? I mean, as you say, the cup of tea is there and it'll be yeah. well, welcome and they'll, they'll be very grateful that you and your colleagues are providing it. But presumably people just need to think a little bit ahead about yeah. preparing themselves. I mean, the, the queue is long. Yep. Um, I think that what we're hearing on the ground is it's not as long as they expected. So some people are coming with lots more supplies than they really need <laughs> and they get to the end of the queue and have to discard them. So uh, I think uh, this is just hearsay what people are telling yes. us, but we, we hear that most people are queuing for five to seven hours. Um, they come prepared for 20. So I, I think, you know, just, just be prepared. It, it's a long time on your feet. Uh, and just know that there's people around who help and support. Lots of other agencies are involved. That there's lots of people wanting to help, which is great. Uh, and, and from our perspective, it, the, there's, a, there's something special about how we've all come together and are all supporting each other. Uh, Major Mike Rose, thank you very much. And our thanks to you. I hope you'll pass them on to all your colleagues yeah, we will. for all the great you. efforts that people are taking. As we appreciate just here, as, as many of us, many of my colleagues here will be here all day. But I know from talking to people in the queues how much they appreciate all the, the kindness and support they receive, not just from your organisation, but from the police and the other community volunteers as well. Major Mark right. Rose, thank you very much. Thank you. And Major Mark Rose there from the Salvation Army. That's all for now from Westminster. But do stay with us on BBC News where we're bringing you all the latest on Her Majesty's lying in state and the plans for the state's funeral. For now, though, back to the studio. Sean, thank you very much. Sean Lay.
It must miss us. Time for a catch up with all the sports news now from the BBC Sports Centre. And Laura, hello. Hi, Martine. Good evening, everyone. Roger Federer has announced he is to retire from tennis after next week's Labour Cup in London. The 20 time Grand Slam winner says it's a bittersweet decision, but there is so much to celebrate. He thanked his family and fans. Here's our sports correspondent, Andy Swiss. Where do you begin with Roger Federer? Not just one of the greats of tennis, but one of the greats of world sport. But as he said in his statement, he is now 41 years old. He's not played a competitive match since he was knocked out of the quarterfinals at Wimbledon last summer. And it seems that the knee injury, which has been plaguing him really in recent years, has finally got the better of him. But he is one of the most successful tennis players uh, that the sport has ever seen. He won the men's singles at Wimbledon eight times more than any other man in history. He was really the king of centre court. He first won it back in 2003. That was the first of five Wimbledon titles in a row. He last won it, won it in uh, 2017 amidst hugely emotional scenes. He won 20 Grand Slam titles in total, uh, six Australian Opens, eight Wimbledons, five US Opens, one French Open. Only Rafael Nadal and Novak Djokovic have more Grand Slam titles than that in the men's game. But as I say, he has suffered with injuries over recent years. He was world number one member for the best part of six years in his prime. But over the last few seasons, we have seen him struggling more and more with injuries. And he says that next week's Labour Cup, a team event, uh, which is taking place in London, will be his final event in competitive tennis. And as you mentioned, this, of course, comes just after the retirement of Serena Williams. So uh, tennis has seen the retirement of two of its greatest players in history in just a matter of weeks. Well, as you would expect, there's been lots of reaction to Federer's retirement from the world of tennis. Wimbledon said, it's been a privilege to witness your journey and see you become a champion in every sense of the word. The great Billie Jean King called Federer a champion's champion with a historic career and memories that will live on and on. And one of Federer's great rivals, Rafael Nadal, said it's been a pleasure but also an honour and privilege to share all these years and amazing moments on and off the court. With more reaction, here's former player and now pundit Annabel Croft. Certainly when I reflect back on his career, I think he was one of the most uh, beautiful tennis players that I've ever witnessed on a court in terms of how he played the sport, the fluidity, the grace, the balletic sort of qualities and artistic qualities that he brought to, to the game. Um, and also the way that he coped with pressure situations. He was someone that very much embraced pressure and sort of walked towards it and um, you know, played so much of his career with a target on his back and yet he coped with that pressure so incredibly well. Now, with the World Cup just over two months away, England manager Gareth Southgate has named his squad for the final round of games in the Nations League. And amongst the 28-man squad is Brentford's Ivan Toney, who gets his first call-up to the senior side. The striker has scored five goals in six league matches so far this season. Goalkeeper Dean Henderson is also recalled for the upcoming matches against Italy and Germany. Manchester United's Marcus Rashford misses out after picking up an injury. Meanwhile, Northern Ireland manager Ian Barraclough has included a new face in his squad. Kofi Balmer gets his first call-up for the matches against Kosovo and Greece later this month. Northern Ireland have gone 14 matches without a win in the competition and have currently just two points from four games. England's one-day captain, Joss Butler, says he and his teammates want to honour the Queen during their historic tour of Pakistan. The squad arrived in the country earlier today ahead of seven T20 internationals, the first of which gets underway on Tuesday. It's the first time England have toured Pakistan in 17 years. That's all the sport for now, Marty. Laura, thank you very much. The founder of the outdoor fashion brand Patagonia has given away the entire company, which is valued at around two and a half billion pounds, to a charitable trust. Yvonne Chouinard said that any profit not reinvested in the running of the business would go to fight climate change. He claimed that the profits donated to climate causes will amount to around £87 million a year. Well, joining us now for more on this is Safia Mini, the founder of ethical fashion brand People Tree and the founder of Fashion Declares, a campaign organisation focused on climate change. Safia, thank you very much for joining us. To what extent is this move by uh, uh, Patagonia in keeping with the ethos of the company so far? 
well, I, I think uh, Yvonne and his team have, have always shown great, great leadership in the clothing and the fashion sector. Uh, it, it, you know, it's building on work they've done over the decades, really, in um, promoting living wages for workers and also regenerative agriculture very recently and also supporting their employees in, in activism, even offering to, to, to bail out their staff if they're arrested on peaceful demonstrations. So they've, they've really become, they've, they've turned from supporting um, uh, activist causes to becoming an activist uh, organization and corporation in, uh, itself. So I think this is a really, really exciting move because it shows really the kind of leadership that we need right now, um, the, the kind of leadership, you know, when, you know, we're, we're in the throes of a climate and ecological and social collapse with 18 billion people on the brink of starvation in Africa and two thirds of Pakistan underwater and 27 of the world's, 27 percent of the world's population that have, have personally experienced um, severe weather conditions in the last five years. So, you know, this is really a wake up call, I think, also for other business leaders to to take bolder action to really look at at, at at systemic and rapid change because anything else just isn't good enough you know decarbonization by by 2050 is 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 not enough um so really excited to see this this um this gift of support because of course we mustn't forget that there are huge business interests that have in, have that have vested business interests that have quietened down and not allowed for the kind of campaigning activism and also the kinds of deep conversation that need to be had both about the climate and ecological and social emergency but also about democracy um so this this gift of of 80 million pounds um a year or more will will really help that process and i i hope that other business leaders will follow rather than just uh you know, keeping their yachts in Monaco and um, in, and 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 having their their wealth stored in um, in in offshore tax havens. But all fashion brands rely on us buying products. Without without us buying Patagonia products, there won't be eighty seven million pounds a year. So it's 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 a strange sort of path that he's having to sort of navigate isn't it because he we need to keep buying so he's got that money but in the process of buying there's a lot of waste that goes on in the fashion industry well i think those serious and in, in the fashion industry are thinking about new models of both production and consumption there's no question that the earth it cannot possibly sustain this level of, of consumption, the level of consumption in, in high income countries like our own. So, you know, we are going to have to look at cutting consumption of 75 percent or more. So th th this isn't news to, to anyone. But but I think what's really key here is, you know, I mean, you had the gesture and the the very public face of don't buy this jacket, the advertising campaign um, several years ago from Patagonia, and I think the the funds raised from the sales actually of of, of what was what became quite a successful campaign went into them setting up their their resale platform. But I think the the resale, the repair, the whole approach now to you know delivering a value added product that is regenerating the soil um, and also supporting communities um, whilst really looking at how we reduce our our footprint on the earth is, is is key. But you're absolutely right, yes. I mean, I was I was with a group of people this morning. They heard the news. They weren't necessarily in ethical fashion at all. But one said, my wife heard that news and she's decided that she's going to buy everything from Patagonia now. So it's interesting, isn't it? Yes, it certainly will appeal to, to some uh, shoppers who have got the sort of the, the time and the money to think about each purchase so carefully. But what sort of trends along similar lines are you seeing in the wider fashion industry? Well, I, I, running fashion declares I, over a period of a year, I spoke to about 100 uh, leaders within the fashion industry. And, 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 and what everyone shared was this frustration that, you know, we, we, we know what to do. We know what best practice looks like. There are the resources there, but there isn't the will and there isn't the, the legislation to support that sustainability becomes totally mainstream and can come to speed and scale. So I think that we're seeing you know, everything from a shift to uh, 
the, the kinds of, of materials that we use. Don't forget, more than two thirds of all the fabrics and materials that we use are based on fossil fuel. So we need to kick out the fossil fuel prop. We need to, to move to, to low impact materials uh, and, to, and to recycle materials. We have 10 years worth of clothing in on, on the planet as it is anyway. So we need to buy second hand. We need to, to resell, we need to, to repair, and we need to, to start looking after what we have. But we also can move to craft. And interestingly, the company that I founded, People Tree, does a lot of craft, and Patagonia also are, are beginning to do a lot of, of craft, hand weaving, and, and techniques like this, because that generates a, a, a large number of livelihoods uh, whilst using um, the least amount of, of natural resource. So, you know, there are lots of different initiatives that are coming out. Um, we, we've been collating some of these best practice um, methods uh, on the Fashion Declares website. So, so it's a, a bottom up movement. Um, everybody within the fashion industry is, is, is coming on to learn about circular economy, about low impact materials, how we, how we start to pay living wages, looking also at the new narrative for fashion, which isn't just about exclusivity and luxury, it's about downsizing our lifestyles, creating low impact um, ways of living and, and, and showing that a totally different way is, is, is possible and, and necessary um, so that we can avoid climate collapse. Safia Mini from uh, People Tree and uh, Fashion Declares, thank you very much. Our main story again. Royal officials have confirmed details for the state funeral of Queen Elizabeth II on Monday. Our correspondent Sean Coughlin is uh, with us. What more do we know, Sean? Well, I think we already knew much of the sort of epic scale of the event. We knew some of the broad outline uh, that the Queen's coffin would go from Westminster Hall to Westminster Abbey, then on to Windsor for, for its final burial. But today we found out some of the more poignant details, some of which uh, are in response to the Queen's own wishes. Um, such as a, a lone piper will play a lament uh, at the end of the two-minute silence. And I can imagine that's going to be incredibly moving. And that will conclude the state funeral. Also, the, the piper will play as the coffin is lowered into the royal vault. I think those sort of moments you feel history will be watching us and the world will be watching this massive event. Because we know, of course, that Prince Philip had a, 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 did a lot of planning and had, um, was very clear about what he wanted. To what extent has that been the same for the Queen? Was she has obviously more bound by certain tradition? Well, that's absolutely right. We're assured that, that she was involved at each stage and she knows about what would have happened uh, at her own funeral. Um, we don't yet know the order of service, and that will perhaps give us a clearer idea of music and, and readings, and we might get some more insight into, into what she particularly liked. We had a little glimpse in Edinburgh for the first service, but we, we think this is reflecting the Queen's interests, her passions, and also her very traditional tastes, and also her very strong religious faith. Now, Prince William has been amongst the crowds today, and he talked about how his grandmother dying has obviously brought back memories of his mother and her well, that's right. He was in Sandringham today with, with his wife and the Prince of Wales and Princess of Wales and well wishers were there and I think he was asked about yesterday when he walked in procession with his brother Prince Harry behind the Queen's coffin and immediately looking at that it brings back those very strong memories of 1997, 25 years ago and Diana's death and he's spoken before about how much it means to him uh, and how close that is to the surface. Um, and today he referenced it again, saying that it was quite hard for him and it brought back memories. So I think it shows that, you know, this is something, his, his brush with early bereavement uh, is still with him. And it's very much something he thinks about and it comes back now with this. And how many people are going to be attending the, the, the funeral? Do, do we know? Because there will be, of course, people who are travelling from uh, overseas, heads of state. Well, we, we think the, there's no official guest list yet. But we think there'll be more than 2,000 people in Westminster Abbey because it's, it's a big old, big old place. And uh, what's interesting about it is you have, as you mentioned, world leaders, Joe Biden, uh, Emmanuel Macron will come, and there'll be all sorts of the great and the good, as well as uh, the royal families and, and all sorts of famous people and powerful people. Also, representatives of the NHS will be there, people who worked through the pandemic uh, and helped uh, their local communities who have since been awarded through the Queen's birthday honours. They'll also be there, about 200 of them. So we're a mixture of ordinary people like us and also the powerful as well. Yeah, and, and the actual service itself, conducted by? Well, that'll be the Archbishop of Canterbury mm -hmm. who, who, who will preside over it. The Dean of Windsor will be there as well. And later, the, 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 there's um, 
the, the, the big state funeral at Westminster Abbey, but then a much smaller committal service in Windsor, uh, in St. George's Chapel, and then finally the burial will be a private service, we won't see any of it, only for very close members of the family at 7.30, I think it is, on Monday evening. We won't see that, but that's where the final burial will take place. Sean, for the moment, um, thank you very much for filling us in on some of uh, those uh, details. Thank you very much, Sean Cochran. Well, let's just remind you that as the nation and people across the world mourn the loss of Queen Elizabeth II, the BBC has set up a web page where viewers and listeners can share their memories and pay tribute. You can send your tribute in words, still pictures or video, by email to yourqueen at bbc.co.uk or on WhatsApp, the number 447756 165. 803. All of those details are on our website and there's also a contact form for you to fill in to make it easier for you. More on the Queen's lying in state here on BBC News but now it's time for the weather with Helen Willett. There'll be plenty more dry and bright weather around for the rest of the day. There is quite a bit of cloud in the skies and it has been thick enough for the odd shower across northwest England, parts of Wales, across Northern Ireland. But the heaviest, most frequent showers are across northern and eastern parts of Scotland, just the odd one in the east. And it's breezy out there, quite a blustery breeze in the north and the east. And the change in wind direction to a northerly has made it feel much fresher out and about and that will continue through the night the breeze continuing to blow showers into northern and eastern areas and around the irish sea coasts as well but temperatures will fall lower even further south tonight into single figures with ground frost in the glens of scotland it's likely we'll see a bit more sunshine around though tomorrow but with that brisk wind picking up further it will carry the showers more showers potentially into eastern parts of England as well as the northeast of Scotland. So another fresh feeling day, perhaps fewer showers in the west. 